I was in Ukraine, um, ready to start medical school. Oh, to be a Jamaican in Ukraine, that was a big advantage. It was a surreal experience to know that Jamaica had such an impact in different countries. I thought I was probably going to be maybe see two or three other Jamaicans that ended up being an entire community of Jamaicans up there. This is Jamaica a beautiful island country in the Caribbean that has been my home for almost eight years. I love this country so much, everything about it. Culture, food, nature, people, especially people, who are some of the most sincere people I ever met. I decided to create this YouTube channel to show how incredible Jamaica truly is, and along the way, debunk a lot of stereotypes that have been spread about Jamaica in mass media. I've been running this channel for two years, doing my best to share positivity. But due to the recent events, I cannot just keep doing this as if nothing happened, because I'm originally from Ukraine. Jamaica you see on this channel is always Jamaica through the eyes of a Ukrainian. This film is the first time when I decided to change places and instead show Ukraine through the eyes of Jamaicans. My name is Tasheva. I'm a Jamaican, but I studied in Ukraine. I am going to be your co-host for this video. I believe we as Jamaicans tend to say what we think. And the 12 students that you see in these interviews had the courage to speak the truth. Even the parts that some might find not flattering, either for Ukrainians or Jamaicans. So, what is it like being a Jamaican in Ukraine? Ukraine is the largest country fully located in Europe. Its population is over 40 million people and there are many big cities. Kyiv is the capital of Ukraine, an ancient city that was built over one and a half thousand years ago and has always been one of the centers of Eastern European civilization. However, majority of foreign students in Ukraine usually choose Kharkiv the second largest city located in the northeast of the country. The reason for this is very simple. Kharkiv is a scientific center of Ukraine. It has 60 scientific research institutes and 41 universities. Among them, Kharkiv National Medical University and Kharazin University, both known for strong medical schools. What was the reason why you chose Ukraine specifically and not other country? So this was in 2016. I had decided I was either going to do medicine or go and do a master's degree. I heard about Ukraine from a friend at church. I applied, I got through, and it seemed feasible because it was within the European continent and the prices were affordable, much more affordable than other universities in the US and in Jamaica. So in 2016, I still was not comfortable with what I was doing, so I decided I would go to pursue medicine because that has always been my dream. Started looking at universities, um, it eventually popped up where um, Ukraine became a part of the picture, applied to it, and I was accepted rather quickly. So it was rather unbelievable at that time. And then by October, I was in Ukraine, um, ready to start medical school. 2016? 2016. 2016. I initially wanted to study at the University of the West Indies, UEMONA, here in Jamaica, but unfortunately, I was rejected and I was then encouraged by my mother to seek education elsewhere and that's when we turned to Ukraine. I did leave during COVID. It was a rough situation but I was willing to try and to see what the world is like because I've always wanted to go to Europe. Previously I was looking at different countries based on government scholarships but Corona happened. <laughs> And then a friend came to me asking me if I knew about Ukraine, the price, the opportunity to go to Europe. So I said, you know, I think it's a good decision and my parents are okay with it. So I just took the opportunity and left. <laughs> 
we were going through different options for university because I didn't want like the so-called um, Western type of education. I wanted to go out because I've always wanted to tour Europe where it has different culture, different experience, a different language because I really like to learn languages. And one of my mentors at the time when I finished my high school examinations called CSEC, she said, why don't you study in Ukraine? Ukraine is such a nice place. The, the people are amazing. So when I went home, I checked it out with my mom and we we're like, first option was Cuba. But then I, I just got so connected to going like on the other side of the world to study. Like Ukraine just became such a good like a good place. And even when I went there, there were no regrets at all. I met so many people. It was like becoming a very, very fulfilling experience. I found out about it from a friend actually who saw it in the newspaper. And I looked into it and I have to admit I was a bit concerned at first because of the conflict they had in 2014. But I really wanted to pursue medicine. And apart from being very affordable, they were the few countries in Europe that offered medicine in English. It was accredited worldwide, recognized by World Health Organization. There was no accreditation issues. And that's why I made the decision to go so far away from, from home. So when I was searching for schools and I heard about Ukraine, we also had some Jamaicans there and I contacted them and hearing about like the culture and mainly the affordability, that's why I went to Ukraine. Did you know anything about the quality of education? The quality, no, I did not. And it's totally different from Jamaica. I remember I was in extra class and my teacher was telling us about studying in Ukraine. So at first I was like, <laughs> that's so far away but she was telling me that the price is like six times cheaper than Jamaica because my school fee is about 3,500 US and the school fee out here is 28,000 US so I was like it's a no-brainer I can't afford to study at UE so the best decision is to go to Ukraine and see how well it works. Well, the experience of studying is way different than what I'm used to out here because when I was in Ukraine, I was getting tests constantly. So they gave a test for every class. Normally out here in Jamaica, you only do exams every term. So every three to four months, you write an exam. But in Ukraine, you write an exam every class. And then the, the exams were orals. Out here, we write on paper for exams. So. When I went to class and I realized that teachers are asking oral questions at first because I'm not the best speaker. So I was flustered at first, but after a while you get the use of it and it's actually beneficial because when you're seeing patients, you can't be writing down stuff. You have to speak to them and explain what's going on. So in the long run, I found it to be beneficial. What is it like to be a Jamaican in Ukraine? <laughs> It's, it had its good and it had its bad. And the good in people are so excited when they learn that you're Jamaican because seeing me or seeing us, you, they would, some people, most people would automatically think, oh, African, oh, Nigerian, oh. But then when they talk to us and they hear accent, they're like, where are you from? And then we say Jamaican, and they say, ah. They want to know Bob Marley, they want to know this, they want to know that. And sometimes it's a bit overwhelming and that is the bad. But um, it's not bad because people are acknowledging your country. Even though the country is so small, a country like Ukraine that's so big, even if you go to like villages or even further in, they would still know something connecting to Jamaica. And it made me feel really proud to be a Jamaican in Ukraine. It, it was a surreal experience to know that Jamaica had such an impact in different countries. Even though we might have our problems here, but we still create an impact and have an impact and I really liked that. It was very special. It was a unique experience because one thing I realized with 
the international students in Ukraine is that they really own their culture, they own their language. There are so many cultures, languages coming together to learn in one place. So as a Jamaican, people would ask me like, what language do you speak? And I would tell them, oh, you know, there is like this English-based Creole that we have called Jamaican Patois. And they would say, oh, say a few words. And you know, in, in your homeland, you take it for granted that you speak this language. But when you go outside and people ask you to speak it, you know, it's a special, unique feeling that you can say something and someone doesn't understand. My friends will come to me from time to time, showing me videos online about Jamaica. And I'm like, oh, yes, this is true. This is true. Yeah. So it was very nice because my friends really accepted like my culture, where I was from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I didn't expect there to be a number of other Jamaicans there. I thought I was probably going to be maybe see two or three other Jamaicans. It ended up being an entire community of Jamaicans up there. A number of people thought Jamaica was in Africa. I, I, I can say that for the majority of Ukrainians that I met, for the ones that knew of Jamaica, they loved Jamaica and they loved me as well, you know. And they also, I, I can see that they had a special love for Jamaicans because even in my classes, the teachers would, there was a special little bond between them and us. Oh, to be a Jamaican in Ukraine, that was a big advantage because, um, I mean, racism is everywhere. So we kind of like argue that point. I have seen some of my friends experience racism, even me, I've experienced it. But when the person have put, um, put the racism towards me and they realize that I'm a Jamaican, their attitude would change. So like, for instance, I had a teacher and she was very um, discriminative against the blacks, whereas the Iran's the Iranian story and the Turkish would be doing the same thing that we were doing and she didn't have a problem. And when the registers in my university, it has your country beside your name. So when she called my name and she saw Yamaika, her personality changed. The entire class turned into she asking me questions about Jamaica. And for the entire semester, she was very nice to me. And I don't think Jamaicans realize that being a Jamaican it's like, it's something that you should be proud of because Jamaica is like one of the most loved country in the world. Like where you, no matter where you're going in the world and you say that you're a Jamaican, you will be loved. That's in my opinion. Cause I've experienced a lot of stuff like that where people would just be kind to me because I'm a Jamaican. I think it is a very unique experience because my teachers, they love reggae. I had a teacher that was like, you're from Jamaica, you're from Jamaica. I'm like, yes sir, Bob Marley, Bob Marley, reggae, reggae. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And you know, they, they know about the culture, you know, they know about Bob Marley, they'll say you sing both, they'll say reggae, you know. And that experience is unique because there's not many Jamaicans in Ukraine. You know, it's a handful. Is there a Jamaican community in Ukraine? Yes, there is. Uh, it is composed of all the Jamaican students studying in Ukraine, and which that's... was 43 students. 43 students 43 in total, students. and that's it. That's what it. about Jamaican party shops? What about there your chicken? There are no restaurants, nowhere you can get Jamaican provisions in Ukraine, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Being a Jamaican in Ukraine, or being black in Ukraine, I don't think persons recognize that you're Jamaican by first glance. But being black in Ukraine, it's no different than being in Jamaica. Nobody is singling you out because you're black. At first, persons may, oh, may I take a photo, but that's it. Mm -hmm. There is no racism, no discrimination. You don't get treated differently based on the color of your skin. But once they do find out that you're Jamaican, it's, do you smoke weed? <laughs> and uh, do you know Bob Marley? Do you know you The stereotypes, right? Yeah. right, right and right, there so is right. this one popular song, Jamaica. Yeah, this is And that's it. Yeah. It had its perks, um, like for example, going home in a taxi. Um, sometimes I try to make conversation with the taxi drivers. This is how I was able to develop my language for the most part. You just um, use a few words that you know. And then they're like, um, where are you from? And you're like, from Jamaica. They're like, oh, Jamaica. And then they will start singing um, Kakaya Bowl, which is a song from um, 1999, I think, when Jamaica got defeated by Argentina 5 0. And then there's another song, um, Jamaica. I don't remember the exact words for that one, but um, these are some of the things that they do um, bring up 
but they're like, oh, Jamaica, it's a very beautiful place. Why you come here to this cool country? And <laughs> things like that. But it was, the interaction being a Jamaican was very good. In 1962, in Soviet Union, there was a song about Jamaica that was extremely popular and played in every home on the radio. The crazy thing is this song is not from Soviet Union. It's actually Italian, in Italian language. And the version that got famous in Soviet Union was performed by a child. Jamaica. The song is about Jamaica being this tropical paradise, being in the Caribbean. And it ends with the words, Jamaica. Under this beautiful sky, I want to live and die. At that time, it was also translated into Russian, and many covers had been done by the Soviet singers up until the 1990s. The song was so popular that even today, when people in Ukraine find out that you're from Jamaica, they start singing this song, assuming that we, as Jamaicans, obviously know it. <laughs> but we don't. In fact, the music and performance cannot be further from what we would associate with Jamaica. But that song sparked interest for Jamaica in Soviet Union. And then Bob Marley became a huge star. And today, reggae is loved by many and our people overall have a very positive image in Ukraine. How's Ukraine different from any Western European country or the United States or Canada? Is it different? Of course, it's different. I have been to a few European countries, Spain, Poland, uh, Turkey, and uh, Ukrainians are a bit more strict in their demeanor. They're not as friendly as persons in Poland or in Spain or even in the US. Mm -hmm. When you say friendly, what exactly do you mean? Uh, friendly, like here in Jamaica, in the US, you're passing someone, you say, hi, good morning, how are you, or something like that. In Ukraine, it's not so accepted if you're not really acquainted with a person. Right, that's, that's true. We, we don't walk around smiling at people. Actually, when I go to Ukraine and I have this habit of smiling at people and greeting everyone, people look at me like really strange. straight. Yeah. Right. That's how we perceive friendliness here in Jamaica. You're walking past someone and you're smiling, mm -hmm. hi, how are you? Uh, so what are your impression of Ukrainian people? They are warm and friendly and it was refreshing to see that Jamaicans were being welcomed in a foreign country because it's usually the reverse. So Jamaicans are usually the ones welcoming foreigners. So it was good to be welcomed by the Ukrainians. It was. But one of the other students, Owen, he mentioned that Ukrainians are not that friendly. So what do you think the reason for that is? I think that's because Owen is male. So, especially the Ukrainian men, they are very friendly towards us as Jamaicans one and women two. Yes, I oh, think yeah. that's the difference. I was not able to make Ukrainian friends because of the program that I am enrolled in. They separate foreign students from national students because of the languages. So I study in English and they study in Ukrainian and it didn't facilitate any mixing or meeting of locals if they didn't speak English. So I wasn't able to make friends, no. How many Ukrainians have you met who can speak English? Quite a few. I think a lot of Ukrainians speak English, but they are a little intimidated or afraid because they're afraid that their English isn't good. But it's better than they expect it to be. And it's refreshing to see that Ukrainians can speak another language. Language barrier was a great ch challenge for us. Uh, no prior experience to Ukrainian or Russian. So thank God for technology now. We were able to communicate through our phones. But I think that's the main drawback as a Jamaican woman in Ukraine, the language barrier. Apart from that, those who spoke English were very willing to help and to be able to try different things. The culture was completely different from Jamaica's and it was fun. I mean, the Ukrainians are wonderful people and I, I really am grateful for what it is that I was able to experience there. I don't know if you agree, but the culture of Ukrainians, they can come off as being aggressive, but 
I'm not going to generalize them as being aggressive because I've met some that are really nice that compensate for the ones that were aggressive. And it's not aggressive towards like a certain type of race or anything because I've seen them just talking normally, but the tone of their voice is just what we would perceive as being aggressive, but they're not aggressive. So when you're saying aggressive, like, do you mean that someone was trying to attack or is it just because No, of the it's just like the tone of the voice. That's it. Nothing else. It's mainly when I'm in school and the teachers, you know, they will come off like they don't care about us. So as international students on a whole, they don't care about us and they don't really know English that well, 100% like, let's say my, myself, that's a native. So when I use certain words, you know, they won't understand or they will misinterpret it. And like the, the feedback that I would get from them in school, it wouldn't be so pleasant. So I didn't like that about Ukraine. It looks like the language barrier was like the main issue. thing, issue. I think the aggressiveness, like with the speaking, sometimes, yes, some, like, sometimes they're not saying things offensive, but because the language sounds so aggressive and because of like, Sometimes how they behave, you think they're coming off rude on you, but if you ask someone to translate, they're not saying anything rude, but I guess it's just different culture and different way of speaking and, and different gestures. There, they also, you were in Kharkiv, right? Yeah, it's I was a in Russian Kharkiv. speaking. City. Russian, yes. Yeah, so most language you hear is Russian. Yeah. And uh, you know, Russian English is different from normal English. So Russian English comes off rude because they translate it directly from Russia. Before the 24th of February this year, a lot of Ukrainians spoke Russian, especially in places like Kharkiv. People this way speak because of Russian influence. Understand? So, yes, Russian language might indeed sound aggressive. Not so much Ukrainian, though. You see, Ukrainian language is actually closer to Polish than to Russian. You can check statistics for lexical similarity. We have 70% with Polish and 62 with Russian. And to understand what it means, English and German have 60% lexical similarity. Russians don't understand Ukrainian in the same way as English speakers don't understand German. And a lot also has to do with pronunciation of the words, intonation and mimics. And this is just another reason why all Ukrainians should stop using Russian and focus on Ukrainian language instead. The problem is, very often when people hear Ukrainians talking, they go, ah, their language sounds just like Russian. Well, that's because they are speaking Russian, unfortunately, because of the same reasons why people in Jamaica spoke Spanish for 100 years until the 17th century and now speak English, the consequences of imperial rule. To my embarrassment, I myself was the so-called Russian-speaking Ukrainian, as well as my husband and my kids. I say was because as many Ukrainians, we have now stopped using Russian and instead speak either Ukrainian or English. Well, have you had a chance to make any friends or meet any Ukrainians? Yes, I have. I think, I think I've met Ukrainians mostly because of my teachers, you know, the ones that are very friendly. And because of the English that they speak, I'm able to communicate with them because I'm not so fluent in the language as Ukrainian. And they're very nice. Every, well, everyone is very nice, to be honest A lot honest of with people you. say that Ukrainians are actually very rude. Really? Yeah, no, because no, no. of the language, the way the language it sounds. It sounds a little aggressive, but if you understand it, you won't be offended or anything. But well, they are nice. The people there are just... They're, they're, most of them are nice people. But I love the fact that they just mind their own business. Um, in comparison, sometimes... Uh, well, this is a bit controversial. But in comparison to Jamaica sometimes, um, you know, sometimes Jamaica, you know, we watch people too much. In Ukraine, everyone's just mind your own business. Even if you're a different ethnicity, um, it doesn't matter. Like, you just go your own way and you, you do your thing. You do realize that some people perceive this as unfriendly. Um, I know. I know some people perceive that unfriendly. I don't really perceive that as unfriendly, to be honest. I mean, if you do approach them, if you need help for anything, most of the time they're going to assist you, even with the language barrier, and which is, um, you know, which is honestly more than what I expected. 
because I heard accounts of racism and so forth. I have, for, for the entire year I was there, I didn't experience one blatant scenario of racism. I believe it's more cultural than anything else. It's the years of oppression from USSR. It has created a kind of, it's better if I stay to myself kind of personality. During the Soviet Union times, it was dangerous to talk to people in the streets because the big brother is watching you. For 70 years, people lived in fear because even the walls had ears. All of this had a huge impact on how society developed, especially in big cities. Even smiling at a stranger was viewed as something suspicious because what are you smiling about? The consequences of all this oppression for many years developed a habit of minding your own business and keeping to yourself. It was a matter of survival. Once Ukraine became independent, this was no longer relevant, but the habit remained especially among older generations who also passed it on to some of the younger ones. I really think that there should be a YouTube channel for each country where people would learn things before traveling. This channel is precisely that, about Jamaica. I just really hope that there will be a foreigner who can do one like this for Ukraine. Not me. It has to be a foreigner because locals take many things for granted. They, they, they just don't see them. And it's difficult to cope with the biases that become a part of us from childhood. have like a love-hate relationship with Ukraine so there are moments where I will love Ukraine and moments where I just want to get out. Ukraine offering certain lifestyle to me I love that because things are easily available. Living accommodation is inexpensive. For food like you can spend a hundred or hundred and fifty dollars a month on groceries. When I watch the television, going to the opera is something of the elites and someone like me going to the opera in Ukraine, like for little or nothing, you know. So I've been to the opera, I've been to the circus, I've been to the zoo. The location of Ukraine and moving to other European countries for vacation, like the ticket prices are so cheap. So the logistics of Ukraine and the cost of living, yes, that's what I love. What I like the most is that things are cheap. That's, that's, come on, that, that's the thing I, I love the most about there. I can survive off of $100. I can do that in Jamaica. Also, I enjoy that, that everywhere you go, you could find a restaurant to buy food. That's, that's amazing. Like out here, you have to drive around for a while to find a, a good restaurant. But over there, it's so accessible and they open so late. You can go at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. and you can get something to eat. I really enjoyed that. So what I liked was the fact that you have um, a lot of green spaces, um, places that people could just go hang out and um, relax. In Ukraine, you could go to the zoo for free. You have a bus that takes you to the zoo. Well, in Kharkiv, uh, you have Felman Eco Park. Ukraine appeared very safe. I have never had any incident of being harassed, um, trying to be mugged or anything. By 12.30, um, a quarter to one at night, the street lights go out and I'm able to walk from the center of the city to my house at 1 a.m. in the dark and I have no problems at all. And this is like an hour walk. When you came to Ukraine, what was your first impression? Cold, <laughs> extremely cold. And I came unprepared too, very unprepared. I didn't have no gloves, so my hands were constantly freezing. And then I know that the people are welcoming, like the many people that I spoke to. I just speak English, some part of English. I spent the first week at the hotel while my apartment was being looked after. And I met this, this waiter who was really kind of sweet to me, who spoke very good English. I think he carried me out a few times to visit Kharkiv. So yeah, very welcome, welcoming city, welcoming country. What did you like most about being in Ukraine? <laughs> Safety. I did a lot of walking in the morning, 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. Peace and quiet, nobody attacked me, nobody cared about me, really. Not something you can do here in Jamaica, so that was my favorite thing about Ukraine in my short time. You came to Ukraine just not even a month before the war? Not even a month, three weeks. Exactly three weeks. We came in Ukraine in December, 
So we didn't really experience much there. So we can't really, you know, give a very clear answer because we don't have enough. We didn't see enough, we didn't explore enough or experience enough to have a general impression of Ukraine. So we were just in Ukraine and then all of this happened out of nowhere. Yeah. Did you have a chance to see Kharkiv at all? No. Oh. <laughs> no. The only thing that we experienced was a Christmas dinner with uh, the Jamaicans. The Jamaicans. <laughs> That's the only That's thing the only we thing experienced. experienced. Like, so, so we were just at the hostel. If it's not at the hostel, we're at school. So everyone else would say, oh, it's beautiful and we loved it. We really can't. The only place is that we could say we have been was Nikolsky. We went to the mall <laughs> once to get some things that we needed. <laughs> That's all. Safety in Ukraine is, was a very big thing for me, a very big culture shock, because in Jamaica, as a woman especially, if you're traveling in the day, it's okay, but especially at night, you'd want somebody with you. But in Ukraine, midnight, I could walk to my friend's apartment, <laughs> no problem. So the safety, especially as a girl, it was really big and I really loved it. I like uh, some of the food, it's very nice, yes. I like Varaniki, the fruit ones, oh, and especially the cherry ones. I love it. <laughs> and I like borscht. I like the variety of transportation. That was really big culture shock. First of all, the metro system. I love it. I love the metro. Sometimes when I'm running a bit late for class, hop on the metro and it cut down my time. It's very cold. <laughs> I'm not used to, I wasn't used to the temperatures at the time. But Ukraine is beautiful. It actually surprised me. It surpassed my expectation of a European country. I have an appreciation for nature and architecture, so I was blown away by what it is that I was greeted with on arrival. What do I like most? The, the people and the food, the people and the food. The people are so beautiful inside and out. Like, even though you might not know how to speak Ukrainian, they will understand you. They will like look at you and try to help you, you know. Even at school, the teachers, some of them aren't the best um, speakers of English, but they still try to help you, which is what I really appreciate as a student because you really want teachers who try to care for you. So I really like that. This is very interesting because a lot of students actually said the opposite. They said they had a lot of problems communicating with teachers. Really? Yes, and that they were not helpful at all. They oh were my. like just listening. <laughs> so I think it really depends on your personal experiences and who the teacher is. Yeah. I think you, you got lucky, they got unlucky. That's probably <laughs> yeah. might be the case. Yeah. It's interesting. I know that you've traveled to some Western European countries as well. And my question is, how different do you feel Ukraine is to other European countries first of all I would say the architecture they all have like some characteristics and because Ukraine has its own culture its own like Eastern European sentiment which is different from countries in the EU there's more monuments in um, Ukraine I think because I feel the vibe in Ukraine is more about strength and unity as a country. I think the whole um, the struggles that Ukrainians face throughout the years, they really turn that into something beautiful. So when I went to Kiev, I visited the Motherland Monument, for example. It was so amazing to see like, you know, this woman just standing there. It's like really, really good. The Motherland Monument in Kyiv is indeed impressive. It is the biggest monument in Europe. It was created during the Soviet Union times by a talented Ukrainian artist, Vasil Borodai, and Ukrainian engineers to commemorate Ukrainians who lost their lives in World War II. The Motherland Monument in Kyiv is facing the aggressor with a shield and a sword, symbolizing defense and victory of Ukrainians. But what's interesting is that it is facing east, symbolizing the defense from the eastern aggressor. Is there anything specific you didn't like? I didn't like winter, I don't like the cold. That, that was really it. Um, apart from people not being friendly, you get around that. But I could not get around the cold, that was it. And it would get very cold, negative 
five, negative seven. And my fingers, they would strip apart. They're even stripped to this day because of the cold frostbites. My ears, it would get cold till it turns red. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm dark. Having to put on the coat every day, and it's heavy, and the snow sometimes, and the ice, you know, I've, I've, I fell a couple times, you know, it's, it's not, not my ideal climate. Um, that's probably one thing I didn't like. Another thing I also didn't like, um, I must admit, um, sometimes there are a few issues, like for example, corruption issues. Um, but apart from those two things, I can't really think of anything else. One thing I didn't like was that even though it was um, Ukraine, it was like Russian was the language that they spoke conversationally. Like, I learned Ukrainian in um, school, and I understood that they changed the language from Russian to Ukrainian because why not? They need to change it. But at the same time, I would only use Ukrainian, the Ukrainian language when I went to the bank or to the supermarket in professional settings. If I was like ordering a taxi or something, speaking to someone, asking for directions, I would have to use Russian. So that kind of puzzled me at first, but I guess I got used to it. But still, I didn't like that the fact that Russian was the language that most people tried to speak. It's changing now. It, it is, <laughs> definitely. What I don't like about Ukraine is the fact that um, people sometimes seem very cold, um, especially like in the university. We, as foreigners, are sometimes treated a bit harshly. And I believe that if it is that you're paying for a service, you should be treated with the respect and dignity that you deserve. Uh, what about the governmental structures? It would be in terms of receiving a POSBITKA, which is a temporary residency permit. You have one personnel who works both in the university and in that office, and you will go to the passport office, for example, in the university. Oh, I don't know, go to the office on Rimarskaya, and then you go to Rimarskaya. What do you want? Sh close door, close door, go outside. And these are some of the things which I found very disrespectful. So they have a tendency to tell you, close the door. I, I'm busy, I can't speak to you now, or you must come back. And then they will walk past you, go to smoke, and just have you waiting for an hour or more. And it's like you're being sent in a maze. Um, it's crazy, and it frustrates you. There was an incident where they misplaced my documents. And I went to them like, there's documents missing from this. And you know what they told me? I should go and find them. <laughs> How am I supposed to go and find them when I gave them to you? In the end, after going back and forth for days, someone else in the, another department of the university took the documents. So I got them back. But they blatantly told me, you didn't give this to us. So when we got it back, I'm like, it's here. It's here. And of course they don't care, like whatever. This last thing that guys are describing is something that Ukrainians have been fighting against for the last 30 years. There is a special term for it, it's called Savok, which is a derogatory term for Soviet Union. Because what you've just heard from Tarek and Jada is one of the consequences of so-called Soviet socialism. You see, no matter how much you might hate capitalism, an important aspect of it is that customer has all the rights and businesses are fighting against their business competitors to get customer attention, your attention, to sell things to you. In Soviet socialism, everything was reversed and nobody wanted to sell anything to you. You might think, huh, this is great, but it isn't. Because when you need something, you as a customer had to fight for it. Nobody was equal, the competition was still there, but not among the companies, among the customers. So all customers were simply viewed as a bother. As a result, what you want, I'm busy, close the door. When Iron Curtain was lifted, a lot of people in Ukraine realized that treating customers as a bother isn't the norm, and huge progress has been made since then. But of course, there are still patches of this savok tumor in some people's heads who you can or could encounter in Ukraine. What is your most memorable experience in Ukraine? There was no one that stood out. I think all of them were memorable for me. I was able to see Kyiv, which is the oh. capital, yes. I went to quite a few museums. I went to the city itself to see the different architecture. And Kharkiv itself was beautiful. So to be able to roam the streets, 
it was it was a very wonderful experience. My friends are my best memories in Ukraine because I was able to be myself without feeling any form of judgment. Yeah, I, I was just me and they accepted me for me and they didn't ask for anything else. Are you talking about your friends who are also foreigners or you mean Ukrainians or both? Foreigners because the system in Ukraine is that, you know, we have an English department and a Ukrainian department. So we don't really interact much with the Ukrainians during university. I wish like at the university they tried to make us all be inclusive with stuff. If they did that, I feel it would have been better. I think my most memorable experience in Ukraine would be the day when I went for a birthday dinner. Yeah, at an all-you-can-eat Ukrainian restaurant. And trust me, I could not eat everything. The food, the flavor, the blends, it was wonderful. And I think that's my most memorable one because I was there with friends, friends from different countries, you know, different cultures, and we were all enjoying the Ukrainian culture. And it was wonderful. My most memorable, going to school on the first day with everybody else, you felt that sense of, listen, this, I'm here now, I'm here, I'm going to school. This is what I came for and I'm actually doing it. Like, I felt so good to be at school again. Being in the atmosphere with different students, getting in class, sitting down with a teacher face to face, it felt, it felt amazing on that day. My most memorable moment was when I traveled to Dnipro in my, I think my first or second year. And uh, I don't know, it's like, I consider myself to be a normal person. But when the citizens saw me, it was like I was a celebrity. So everyone came to me, they were like, oh, Krasiva Devushka, very beautiful girl. They wanted to take picture with me and everything. Even like professional photographers would stop me and ask me like, can I do a booking with you and all those stuff. So that's my most memorable moment. In last year, August last year, when I went to Odessa, I went to the beach in Odessa and it was perfect. It was almost like the beaches in Jamaica. The only thing I didn't like was that there were jellyfishes there. But other than that, it was perfect. The sun was good, the water was good. Mm -hmm. That's the Black Sea. Yeah. Ski for the first time. Yeah, it was, it was, very, it was very thrilling. Um, and we were skiing from a mountain in Harkiv or outside Harkiv. So it was, it was really cool. Um, we didn't have any instructors or anything of the sort, so we were learning by ourselves and going that fast um, downhill and not having experience, constantly falling, just having good company and, you know, rolling in snow, rolling downhill. It was really good. Did you make any friends in Ukraine? Yes, I did. Um, and the friends that I made in Ukraine is what helped me to get out during the whole um, invasion. Are they Ukrainians or mostly foreigners? Mostly Ukrainians. My landlord introduced myself and my roommate to Frisbee. And at Frisbee, we met with a good number of Ukrainians who do speak English. From there, we developed a relationship, um, got invited to their summer house, met their families, and they kind of accepted us as a part of their um, extended family. So one time we went to their village for Easter. So this is called Pascha in Ukraine. Uh, we went to the church about midnight or one o'clock and we went to get the Easter blessings for the food and everything. So just standing out there lighting candles, having the, the priest walk by, just blessing the food with holy water and everything. It was just an awesome experience because this isn't something that we do have in Jamaica. Is Easter very different in Ukraine though than in Jamaica? Very different. Um, in Jamaica we have Easter, but in Ukraine you have um, Pas Pascha. 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 Yes. Um, the Ukrainians, they go more with, um, you know, decorating eggs and um, so boiled eggs is a very big thing in Ukraine and they have this game where you're supposed to challenge another person. So you paint your eggs and then you challenge a person and you knock the, um, the ends of the egg together and then you try to see who, who, who will be the champion. Whoever hits the eggs and break it, then you're, you win. My most memorable experience in Ukraine was spending the 
Christmas and New Year's weekends with my friends. I had Christmas dinner with the Jamaicans, which was absolutely amazing. We ate some really, really nice Jamaican food and it just brought me back home. I just felt like I was at home, you know, for once since I've been in like a foreign country across the world. And for New Year's Eve, I went to church with my friends again. And after we spent the night out and we we're partying and everything for New Year's Eve. And it was just an amazing experience. Just entering the new year with people that you really care for is really special to me. Even though winter is very harsh, I really love the decorations during winter. The winter wonderland was perfect. You know, we don't experience winter in Jamaica. Going to Ukraine on Christmas Day, because we had two Christmases. We had the 25th of December and we had the 7th of January. On Christmas, no matter how depressed I was, going to the square, seeing all the decorations, it just uplifted your mood. For every major holiday, there was some form of decorations that you could look forward to. I was surprised to learn that there is a Ukrainian folk song that is so popular in the world that even us Jamaicans are hearing it and singing it every single year without realizing that it is a Ukrainian folk song. The words for this song were written originally in Ukrainian language a few hundred years ago and then a Ukrainian composer wrote down the music in 1901 and then Ukrainian National Choir went on this tour with this song around the world. After their performance in 1922 in the US, this song became one of the biggest world hits, later translated in English, and now it is viewed as an anthem for Christmas. I'm sure you will recognize this song from the very first notes. Here's the original in Ukrainian. Необхідні речі, валізу нехай лежить у вас вдома. Хто не чув, повідомити також необхідно сусідів і бути готовим до того, що можна.
The invasion began at 3.40 a.m. local time, with Russian troops moving into the Luhansk area of Ukraine. In about one hour, a pre-recorded speech by the President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, was broadcasted, where he confirmed the start of what he called special military operation in eastern Ukraine. In reality, the whole country was shelled and Kharkiv was one of the main places under attack. As a result of this invasion, in just four months of the war, a third of the population of Ukraine was displaced, almost 13 million people. It is the biggest crisis in Europe since the times of the Second World War. The reason for the war is just one and a very straightforward one. Ukraine wants to be an independent country. Russia doesn't want Ukraine to be an independent country. As to why this is the case, the reasons come from as far back as 10th century AD. It's a long story and I'm not going to go into the details here. But just to make it clear, Russia wants to colonize Ukraine, make it a part of Russia and exploit our land and people. Ukrainians don't like the idea and refuse to submit to Russia. Therefore, Russians have come to kill us. But there are always two sides of this story. Of course there are, even more than two. Russian propaganda has made up many such stories. Murderers always have their side of the story to tell. And the more atrocities they commit, the more stories they make up. But in case of this war, it's very easy to see who the murderer is. Russia is attacking Ukraine. Ukraine has never attacked Russia or any other country. Were you planning to leave Ukraine when you heard all of these things happening before the war? At first, no. At first, I genuinely thought it was a bluff. I saw the troop build up. I was a bit concerned. Um, and then the US media started to go crazy about, you know, impending war, Russia is going to invade. I still didn't think it would actually happen. But my parents started to get really worried at a certain point because we were like, okay, should we gamble my life or a flight ticket? So we booked a flight um, and then I went to Kyiv the Tuesday before the war but they blocked me from the flight. Turkish Airlines, they blocked me from the flight because of a vaccination issue. I had single dose, they needed double dose. I booked a next flight for the Thursday, um, Thursday night. I booked a hotel, I woke up, flight is canceled and the invasion has started. So I was now trapped in uh, Ukraine. I was, I was so upset. I was in Jamaica. January 15th to February the 6th and you know when I was coming back that's when all these talks were happening and my friends and families were like Chelsea why are you going back what is going to happen I'm like no I've heard this stuff all these years nothing is gonna happen and I arrived <laughs> the 6th and seeing that the explosions in Kharkiv happened the 24th I don't know. I don't know how to explain that because I had no idea that that would have happened. Looking back at it, I wouldn't say I was naive, but I was in, I was in an atmosphere where I didn't need to worry because someone, there's a journalist on TikTok, she said, she explained it so perfectly. She said, imagine you're living in a bath of hot water you're living in it, you know, it's hot, you know, but you're living in it, but everyone around you is seeing the steam and they're saying, it's hot, it's hot, it's hot, you need to get out. But you're like, hey, this is where I live. Nothing is wrong with it, it's just water, it's just hot. So that's how I felt in the situation. When it came down, like, end of January, I realized that the, consul the consulate in Germany reached out to us and in my head I was saying, if the consulate is reaching out now, then what is happening outside that we're not seeing? Something is happening. I made a decision to go to Turkey for a month. So I had booked the ticket the Wednesday night and then bombing start Thursday. So 
I didn't end up going. The night before, I keep telling persons like, the days before the invasion, everything was 100% normal. Everything was business as usual. There were no signs at all to say that, oh, Russia is coming to invade. The only thing that would make us bothered or worried was the, what was being portrayed in the media. Okay. That, that was it. But did you make a decision to leave? I made a decision to leave uh, mostly because my parents were worried. Not because I was worried, but because they were worried because of what they were seeing on the media. I had a ticket for the 24th of February, which is when everything started, unfortunately. Owen, from high school, he was a dedicated student. He knew exactly what he wanted. Someone told him of Ukraine. He applied and he got through. So one day I came home and he was like, Mom, what if you hear that um, I got accepted for Ukraine? I knew nothing about Ukraine at the time. I still don't have any regrets in him going to Ukraine. I loved what I heard about Ukraine. It was an opportunity for him to get what he really wanted. And I encouraged him and I endorsed it to the end. And if it is that he needs to go back, I would send him back. As a matter of fact, I was talking to him the other day and he said, Mom, if it wasn't because of you, then I wouldn't be here. I would have been there helping them to fight. So I know that he loves it. How did you find out that the war began? When we had our pediatrics exam at nine, I got up at four to study and uh, I fell asleep and at five I was awoken by explosions. Persons who were living closer to the border, they could actually see the explosions going off and sent videos of what was happening. Mm -hmm. But you were a little further in Kharkiv. I was in the countryside, so I didn't see anything, I just heard it. So that was Wednesday night. I was on the phone with him from then until he left Poland. I didn't sleep. I threw a mattress down in my living room on the floor. I never used to watch news, but I started watching news there and then, and I was basically glued to the TV on the floor in here because I didn't want to disturb anybody else. So I was in here lying down day and night. I, had, I didn't go to work. I didn't do anything. I was just there with him. Every move he made, I was there. Um, he tried to comfort me to say that there is nothing happening. But the fact that I know, at one point, he's, um, I heard him say something like, Mom, there were bombs going off, so we had to go down. The good thing is, I knew that he was safe somewhat. Owen is someone who really believes in God. And I remember at one point he said to me, Mom, if this is the way the Lord wants me to go, then we can't do nothing. The only thing I need to ensure is that my soul is prepared. And that gave me comfort somewhat. However, I still had concerns regarding the incident. And then when I found out that they had no way out, then that was another part of it. I had been having dreams of it before because I was somewhat scared. And I actually purchased my ticket to go to Turkey the Thursday morning, a couple hours before the war started. I thought I was dreaming again when I heard the explosions but I was lying in bed to see if I would hear something else. So I heard the first set and I said maybe I was dreaming because of how terrified I already am. And then I heard another set of explosions. We're filming one month after these events. Yeah. So, and as we're talking, like as I was talking to Owen, he kept smiling. And the same, you're, when you're talking about the situation, you're smiling. Why do you think this is the case? Because I'm sure people are going to watch, like, why is she smiling? When she's I talking? think that's how I cope. Smiling is a coping mechanism for us as Jamaicans. We try to show a brave face, even in hardship. Funny enough, I had literally just got off the phone with my mother. We were discussing that, OK, we should leave. No, no is the time to leave. My roommate, living in the dorm, he was asleep. And I was there, and I was just on the bed. And then this, this, this is just all that you see, it's just shaking. Then it stopped. Then you hear the shaking again, and they do just hear something in the background. And then you get up, and then you see people running out. What's that? What's what's happening? What's happening? And and I was up at 2 a.m. Luckily, I didn't fall asleep because if I had, I would have been literally blank to what had happened. I was about to just go to bed actually, five o'clock in the morning. I was not in a 
rushed to leave because I wanted to get admitted into a university at least before I consider leaving. So that was not on my mind. I was not buying what tickets, to be honest. I was not even planning to leave the country, to be very honest with you. What I heard in my apartment was all the doors opening and every, the sound of people hurrying are going downstairs. So when I opened the door, I saw all the family members with their kids, their bugs, their dogs going downstairs. And I'm like, what's going on? And then I heard, boom. And I was like, oh, oh wow, I'm in trouble. I was shaking. I like, I almost felt like, like I was losing control of my body, shaking in my bed, could not move. Like I was in a state of paralysis for like a good 10 minutes. It was horrible. It was horrible. It's the first time hearing bombs, so I was in, I didn't know if it was bombs. I just thought it was like some warning. So I went to look out the window, pitch dark, nobody's outside. I'm just hearing the noise, the, the bombings. And then it started to get closer where you could feel the vibrations. And then a plane flew lowly over my apartment and the entire apartment started to shake. So at that moment, I'm not a crier, <laughs> but at that moment, I, I started, Tears started to fall from my eyes and I was shaking because I was like, God, am I really caught up in this war? So in my head, I'm like, God, how am I going to escape this now? I was literally sleeping and then I just heard bombs. And when I got up, I didn't, I didn't think it was that at first. I thought it was like thunder. But after I heard like five, six bombs, I was calling my mom. She picked up. I was like, Mom, the bombs have started dropping. Like, it's actually real now. Something's going on. And it's like serious because I looked out of my window and I could see like some smoke in the air or something. So I was like, yes, yeah, something is definitely going on. Before Rihanna went to Ukraine, oh, we always told her about Russia, Ukraine. You know, and in January, when watching the news and everything, I started preparing her. So I, you know, I said to her, always have a go bag so you can pull and run. Our plan was that if something should happen, she could stay in her hostel and everybody else is there. So she would have the company of her other hostel mates. So, um, so that was the plan. But when she said, no mommy, this is not it. The bomb's going off. I said, all right then, pack, let's go. So that was when the parents, because there are a group of parents on WhatsApp, we, you know, I said, I said to one of the parents who was more savvy than myself, I said, let us get everybody else back into this group. And we started. And so we had our first meeting as parents. My husband got the map and put it in the WhatsApp and said, this is where the west side, this is Ozorod. Might be pronouncing it wrong. This is where it is. Let us move them to there. And so that was the original plan. They would move to the west side, you know. When you find out that your child is basically stuck in a war zone, how I, I, I think I probably was worried, but you see, if I became worried, she would be worried. So I had to put this face, I had to, a lot of prayer went into it. You know, a lot of prayer went into it. And I know that if I became nervous, she would also become nervous, you know. Was your first thought, oh, I need to contact the Jamaican government and make arrangements? No, my first thought was to contact the people around me to find out if they were safe. That was the first thing that came in my mind, just to message the other Jamaicans and say, hey guys, are you guys hearing this? Are you guys okay? I've never been in that situation before. I've never experienced war before. In a country you're from, in Jamaica, you're not, you're not used to war threats. You know, you would see war and acts of war in countries abroad. So my first thought was not to call the government. My first thought was, how do I leave here? How do I get out? Because everywhere was closed. Get to safety and plan what next. So yeah, safety was the first thing that was on my mind. How do I get out of this building before something collapses on us or on me? We didn't want to leave anyone behind. And so we were coordinating when it would have been best for us to leave together, seeing that we weren't all in the same place. So we decided to stay the night in the bunker, bomb shelters, the closest points, so as to not be exposed. And then we would try to go to Lviv on the Friday because everybody would now be able to go to the train station from where we were. 
So the WhatsApp group is a group which has existed for years. So this is our main um, means of communication once it pertains to something that is group related. We usually communicate there on a daily basis. And then Owen, because he had sent off the list to the consulate in Germany, he was able to contact the other persons um, in the other cities to see if they were still in Ukraine or they had already left. We contacted, well not the government, but the representative who was in Germany. Uh, she was unfortunately unaware of the situation happening because she was sleeping. Uh, of course, it's 6, yeah. Yeah. So I got her at 9 a.m. and made her aware of what was happening. Um, we're taking it step, step by step. We got a warning from the mayor of Kharkiv saying that we should all find a nearest shelter and everything. So we were like, okay, it's getting serious. We need to pack our necessities. So seeing that I just came back, I had my suitcase already packed, so I took my suitcase with me. It was even a discussion between us. They were like, oh no, Chelsea, it's too big. If anything, it's going to keep you back. I'm like, no, I'm taking at least one suitcase with me because I need, I need something. I can't leave everything. I need something. So we went to the, the shelter that was near us. So when I went to the metro, I saw thousands of people and I went early. I went like at 8 a.m. and there were thousands of people in the metro already. So that's another realization shock for me that this is really happening. How do they fit in? You have to make yourself fit in. It's a war situation. Everybody wants to be safe. Nobody cared about COVID protocols right there because there was no personal space and that was understandable. Everybody's trying to make sure that they survive. Were you all sleeping on the floor? Yeah, we were sleeping on the floor. The good thing is that I carried a blanket because I expected that, so I brought a blanket with me. It was like completely packed. It, it was hard to find space to like to see. just be in the space. People were there with their children, their animals. Everyone was there, foreigners, Ukrainians, all gathered in this spot just trying to figure out what to do next. So with having the language barrier, that on top of being the foreigners, yeah. and in this situation... You can imagine. No. <laughs> the metro? In the shelter, yeah. It was something, like the spirits were high. But then at one o'clock, when all the kids were out of sleep, you could feel the atmosphere is changing. The parents were like no longer smiling, you know. They were not, were not, they were not no longer keeping up the facade because the kids did not know what's happening, and that was really heartbreaking to see. And they started crying. I saw some of the fear of them started crying. And wow, I couldn't actually stay there. I left the shelter to walk around a bit, and then came back in like an hour later. It was really heartbreaking for me to sit down there and watch because I couldn't sleep either. Did you see any people thinking, yeah, good, Russians came? No. Like, what was the reaction? Everybody was sad and... I remember this moment, right? I think we were walking to the shelter and somebody shouted, thanks for some reason. I don't know why. And a huge panic happened. And we all had to run in. And then after somebody said, thanks, boom, I missed his truck. And then we were walking in the shelter now. Some people were cursing, some people were watching um, President Zelensky. He was doing a live at the same time. Some people were causing some people are dead, some people are sleeping. So there was not really any, yes, the Russians are here, we're liberated, let's go. None of that there. Did you actually leave on the first evening or you left the next day? I left on the first evening. So um, at about four o'clock, my friend called and there's a bus going. So the bus was provided by his sister's company and um, they were evacuating their families, the employees and their families who were in Kharkiv. This usually would have been a 14, 15 hours journey from Kharkiv to Lviv. Unfortunately, it took two full days. Um, the bus used some not so central routes. We bypassed Kyiv altogether because Kyiv was under attack. And the routes that we used were some forested country roads. And we had to detour from these routes several times because I'm not, sure exactly what was happening but the driver would stop he would look out for a minute or two and then turn around 
But you know, like a lot of traffic was on the road. So a lot of roads were blocked. So how did you manage to get out? The driver was just... The driver, maybe he had Google Maps implanted in his head, but he wasn't looking at any maps. He just knew exactly where to go, what to do. I think at maybe every 12 hours he would stop and he was tired. So he rested for maybe 30 minutes to an hour and then we were off again. Oh, okay. As it relates to food, unfortunately, we only stopped for food twice. Uh, because most shops, most gas stations were closed. So we only got to buy coffee twice, and that was it. Okay. Did you have any snacks with you, anything at all? Uh, we had uh, crackers with us and a tin of sausage. That was what kept us for the two days. Talking about other Jamaicans who are much newer to Ukraine, did you try to help those other Jamaicans? Yes, we did. So initially when I got the call that, all right, um, we're going to come for you, there's a bus and whatnot, the first um, reaction was, do you have space for um, 26 more Jamaicans? And it's like, oh no man, we don't have any more space, I'm sorry. But just get yourself together. So um, we just did a little reshuffling, um, threw some food in, some, in a bag and then we left. But then you decided to wait for everyone else in Lviv? Yes, we did. Why? why? Uh, honestly, it was just um, the right thing to do because we were the more experienced ones um, in Ukraine. You were also quite fluent in Russian language, as far as I know. No, I was very good, but I was not very good. You were Russian in Ukraine, right? Yes, I was in Ukraine. Um, four years ago. When the evacuation was, did you speak Russian for Russian? Did it help you? No, because we are now in Western Ukraine, and we are speaking Russian for Ukrainian language. How did you decide what you're going to do next? Okay, that was a group collective effort. That was a collective effort because Tariq was in contact with government. Everyone else was trying to, to, get to, to contact taxi services, which was so hard. Eventually, it took us like two hours to get a taxi just to get to the train station in Kharkiv in order to go to Lviv. And then trying to get to Lviv was a whole nother ordeal. I called my parents on a two-way call. I said, Mommy and Daddy, it, it, they're, they're hearing the bombing and everything. And I said, I'm packing a suitcase, I'm packing a suitcase. And I was digging, searching for stuff that I needed. Because I was packing, it just, I, I don't know. Like, it felt like I wasn't living in the moment. I felt like I was on autopilot. Everything I was doing it was on autopilot. I had no control over my body. That's how I felt in the moment. It wasn't until I landed in Jamaica I said, it's okay to relax a bit now, Lissandra. But I didn't, I didn't know that I was in this situation until I was at the train station and I almost didn't leave Kharkiv. In the first few days of the Russian invasion, there were reports in Western media saying that African students were discriminated because they were not allowed on buses or trains, and that the buses and trains were evacuating Ukrainian citizens only, or as a priority. Only Ukrainians, that's all. That if you are black, you should walk. We're going to look at both of these, buses and trains. So first, buses. The part that the media forgot to tell you is that there were no buses taking people to the border at all. From the 24th of February, all airplanes were grounded and because everyone was evacuating west, the roads were blocked with traffic and any public buses on that road were stuck for several days without an ability to come back and pick up other passengers. Nobody could leave Ukrainian cities by a bus regardless if they were a foreigner or a Ukrainian. It was physically not possible. The other issue was fuel. All gas stations either shut down or there was a limit of only 20 liters per vehicle. That wouldn't even get you half the way to the border. 
As a result, if you had no private car or buses organized in advance, like the company did for the friends of Tariq and Owen, the only way to leave was by train. Ukraine has a highly developed railway system with a total track length of over 23,000 kilometers, making it the 13th largest in the world. It's called Ukrainian Railways and it's 100% state owned. The reason I'm telling you this is because a railway station in a big city in Ukraine doesn't look anything like this, it looks more like this. There can be up to 12 trains at one given train station at the same time going in different directions. Before the invasion, there had been scheduled trains all across the country, including say trains going from Kharkiv to Lviv. And there had already been people who had the tickets for those trains because they were planning to travel for whatever personal reasons without realizing that an invasion was going to happen. The trains are usually between 12 to 16 carriages and most tickets for them were already sold. So to accommodate extra people evacuating, extra carriages were added at the end making trains extremely long and hence most people with no tickets were sent to the back to board. At 6.30 in the morning, my roommate's boyfriend got information that the trains were free going to other cities so we can take them. So I was the one that dropped the information in the WhatsApp group, the Jamaican WhatsApp group, and I was like, guys, I heard that trains are free. Let's go, let's go at eight. For some reason, I got up at 6.30 on the dot, and by seven, I saw messages in the group about going to the train station. So I just, I took my bag, because my bags were already packed and everything. I was ready to go. So I was one of the first Jamaicans to reach the train station. And yeah, so we all gathered at the train station and we decided that, oh, we're gonna take a train to Ushkorod. We were standing in the snow. It was like snowing a little bit, but it was very cold that day, very, very cold. And it was, it was different because the days before were a bit hotter, but this day was cold. We arrived at the train station around 9 a.m. initially, and we were waiting on the other Jamaicans to come. So we had missed the first train. The first one left at 8.30 and we decided that the next possible train we would have boarded. So I think this was around maybe 10.30 or so and we were waiting for the train to come. Upon entering the platform, we started to hear fire. I don't know if it was aimed at where we were, but it sounded very close to us. And so we had to seek refuge underground. The platform was jam-packed. It wasn't just normal packed, it was jam-packed. I didn't know that there were so many people planning and evacuating that day. Foreigners, Ukrainians, everyone was at the train station trying to get through. You know, I expected pushing on the train. I was actually speaking with some of the other Jamaicans. I was observing the environment and was like, guys, this is going to be rough. Look at how everyone looks eager. If a train pulls up right now, there won't be any order. And funny thing is, one of the Jamaicans was telling me that if you think like this, this is what's going to happen. But I was saying, no, bro, it's observations. Everybody looks eager and scared. So I, I expected the pushing. There were some specifications to get on the train. So initially, I, I saw that they were saying that people with tickets will go on the train first. I didn't know that we needed tickets. I just thought that everyone was just, transportation was free. So those that had tickets, got on the train first so they were able to secure spaces and then after that it wasn't much spaces remaining because there were so many people and we didn't have tickets and it's like survival mode everyone's trying to get on this train to get out we were like trying to reserve our spot at the front of the platform so everyone was just up there and when the train came bombs started like two minutes after the train came bombs started and we had to run down there were children screaming the pets barking the pe pe people were swearing people were like getting on the train but some some friends got on the train some other friends didn't go on, get on the train so people experienced being separated from people they loved and stuff so it was like very very emotional for so many people us Jamaicans decided to go down into the metro but we were separated from three of us so as we were counting off and saying okay Rihanna Blake is 
hair, she's hair, he's hair. We decided that three of us weren't there, so all of us started panicking. Where is he? Where is she? You know. We went to get tickets because we, did, we didn't know what to do. The first experience, as soon as we got into the train station, we're going for tickets, boom. That was a bomb outside. Person started rushing in. We had to rush underground. Train station is there, but there's also the metro station underground. Everyone had to run inside the metro deep underground to get, to get cover. We literally went down, we started to pray, we held hands together, we sang God is here, we prayed just to get some sort of relief. So I think finally the third train came. It was a big train. Jesus, that was chaotic. It was a big train at that time, but we were not at the front at this time, we were at the back because we didn't know which platform it was on. We had to know the platform and the track, so we had to be switching from one platform to another, to from one track to another. Up. So we were going up and down the stairs with our carry-ons and our bags. Trying to figure out where we track should be. our platform to be on. And she didn't know. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't walk on the track because yeah. clearly we could get electrocuted. But there are people that was running across the tracks, like they were risking it all. They need to go, they're running across the tracks, going to the other side. So like when that train arrived, the only thing that we saw was like birds flying. Like we use the bird as indicators. <laughs> Once you see the birds flying, of white birds, bombings are like, coming. Is that a signal? And then I realized every time the birds moved into a direction, it bombs were dropping in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So we started using the birds as markers. Whenever we saw them, we got a bit nervous, like, okay, the birds are moving. So the birds are flying and then we just heard the We bombings. just heard the explosion. And then the smoke started coming over on the platform and people are running, so it's a stampede. And but at that run. time we were still contemplating on if we should like still go on the train or if we we're should like, go down. We say, should we even leave? But then the stampede is coming, like we're about and to get run over, so we have to move. For the second explosion, we definitely ran. It was like people running on each other stepping in each other back, climbing on Someone each other. Someone fell, one of us fell. This lady like pushed her down and stepped on her. So, it was a lot. And then we had to run to the metro station. At that time, we were just panicking. We were crying. And then Lots we just came too. together as Jamaicans and we decided that we we're going to pray. And we were just praying, constantly praying. praying. And people singing were like staring at us. I ain't never seen no sight like this before. And then I think we saw like a Ukrainian person, they were crying and we we're like, if you're crying, then what should we do? Because people have a we're not from here. We don't know what to crazy. do in this case. Do you think you had some sort of an advantage of being in Kiev when all started rather than being in Kharkiv? Or do you think it was more of a disadvantage for you? I think to some extent I was at a disadvantage. Um, because in Kyiv, I heard it was horrible in Kharkiv as well, but there were a lot of people trying to leave Kyiv because, you know, they were talking about the city being surrounded, the gridlock was horrible on the roads, and the train station was packed. Like, when I mean packed, I mean you can barely enter the train station, much less to get on a train. And then being alone as well, that, that's probably the worst feeling, honestly, because at least with the group, you know, you'd have a little of reassurance, you know, you're with other people, you can stand up for yourselves, you know, you guys are in this together, you know. But being alone, I was just scared of me being stuck in Kyiv and then the group making it west and then they just leave me behind. That was my biggest fear, yeah. Ma the majority of the fighting at that point was in the east. It still is the majority in the east. So I was like, it doesn't make much sense for me to go east to regroup with the Jamaicans. I should just find my own way west. So I left the train station, went to the bus park. I waited there for probably four hours in the cold, standing with my luggage. No bus. The ticket booth for the bus was closed. At this point, it was getting dark. So I was in my head, I was thinking, OK, do I spend the night out here in the cold or do I go back to my hotel? Or do I try my luck again with the train station? Try as hard as possible just to get in. Push if I need to push, pull if I need to pull, whatever I need to do just to get on that train. When I was running down, I went to a door, I begged them, can I please enter the train? And then she said, ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. And then she pointed down the platform. Maybe I got the, the words wrong or the pronunciation wrong, anyway. And then I, I kept running down and then a man said, come. And the relief I got, I, I ran to the door 
and then I just uh, threw up my suitcase and I even lost a shoe because of that. Yeah, I lost a shoe and um, in the mess, I somehow also got a cut on my arm and, and as well. Yeah. We finally got on a train. Even that was hard to get on. You had to do some running to get on the train. And the girls carried so much suitcase. The boys had to be the ones lifting, on, lifting the suitcase on the trains. So imagine we have our knapsacks on and we have the girls' suitcase and we're trying to push to get on the train. But by the time we got to the train, so the, on the platform at 9 p.m., there were three different trains and we didn't know which one it was. And everyone who was still left at the train station, we were wondering the same thing. Eventually we found which train it was. And once everyone found out, it was just chaotic, chaotic again. So we were just running with all our stuff and it was, you know, the train is long. So we were just running so much, so much, so much in the cold. Everyone was running by the time we were able to get onto the train. There were actually some people pulling us off the train to be able to go into the train. So it was were very chaotic. Um, there were like probably some Nigerians, some Albanians. Yeah, oh, that so it was the that. other foreigners? Yes. Who were trying every... to pull you out so they could get in? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, oh, I see. So how did you manage to get in? I guess, well, I put my bag in first and I was just... I was just forcing myself in at this point because people were like holding on to the back of my, my blouse. So I was just trying to get on the train, but eventually I did, I did, I did get on the train. Yeah. It was by the grace of God that somehow we saw the police carrying some Ukrainians to another side of the track and I followed them. The Jamaicans that were there, the 20 of us, we were split up in some way, followed the Ukrainian and when we saw what he was doing, he was putting them on a different train. And we're like, where's this train going? Where's the train going? We didn't even know. But we jumped on the train. I ran into the train and I didn't even know if anyone else made it. But I was about to come off because we were hearing that some of us, some of the others weren't on it and he didn't want to leave anybody behind. However, as soon as I was about to board off, another Jamaican came on. And then we started to keep in communication. Hey, did you make it? Did X person make it? Did Y person make it? And we accounted for everyone like that. And that is how we even got out of Kharkiv. So we didn't come as a group. We all came separately, which was just nerve wracking because me and Joel were on the train first. And the, the actual journey called me and like, Matthew, where are you? I'm like, I'm on the train. And she's like, what do you mean you're on the train? I'm like, I'm on the train on platform four. Where are you guys? She's like, we're on platform three. I'm like, Jordan, hurry up, let's go come to the back and then yeah that's how I got on the train for the rest of the people it was a mess for them Chelsea had to fight for some of them to say that they're her sister and stuff because the conductor said the carriage was full the carriage was full go to the next carriage so yeah were the carriages full the first carriages was a book because like I said everybody congregated to the first carriages but when the train started they sent people to the back carriages which was quite empty Conductor told us go to, I think that was platform three. It was like go to platform four, she three. But you know, a lot of them, they do not understand. So he was holding up his hands and he was showing us four, go to platform four. So we were there as a group. When I heard four, I ran because, you know, this is a life or death situation. You want to get out. I ran and I only saw four other students with me when we went on the train. I was calling the others, I was asking them, where are you guys? Where are you? They're like, they're coming. They got held back, they're coming. So I was shining the flashlight at the window. I was like, guys, come on this wagon, come. I was screaming. I was asking the conductor, please, because they closed the door by then. I was asking them, please let them on and everything. So, yeah. You ma they managed to get on? Yes, they did. But you Everyone. managed to get on first? First, yeah. With was, the suitcase? No, yes, with the suitcase. I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not staying, no. Because, you know, I could have left earlier. Yes, right. With, but, even with my roommate. She right. left at four. There was a train at four, but we heard explosions and we ran. So I was like, you know, I could have gotten out a long time, but I chose to stay with my Jamaicans. So, you know, I have to leave now because we don't know what's going to happen. Did someone try to take you off the train? No. no, no not on no, this? No one tried to take me off. No. That was life or death. That's all I could describe it as. Life or death. It, we, when we missed that train, that mid, that afternoon train, we went down back into the metro and I, in my head I was like, if I don't get on this 9 o'clock train, 
I don't know. I don't know if I'll, if I'll ever be able to leave Ukraine. I don't know if I'll be able to see my parents. I don't know what would happen. I remember when I pushed and I got on the train, I turned around and they shut the door and two of my friends were outside. I was crying to the conductress saying to her, I was saying to her, my sisters are outside begging her to take them on. And she said, no, 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 the train is full. Crying. Did you get them? They ended up on the wagon behind me. When we finally started to board, there was this student in particular who became very chaotic in his behavior. So he started pushing and he was shouting and the conductor saw and there were only four of us as Jamaicans left on the podium to board the train. And because that person was in front of us who were remaining, they closed the entrance to the train. So we thought hope was over, but another conductress saw us communicating with each other, wondering if this was it and she opened her carriage, which was found out to be very empty. There was no other person but us who boarded. And that's how we were able to make it onto the train after being there for so long. That train, it wasn't even posted on the board. I don't know who found out about it, but Someone when I posted on the phone, they were on the phone talking to other people, they were on the phone looking up stuff, and they came back and they were like, hey, there's an next train coming. At nine. Like, okay, we have to make this train. Like, it's not a question. But we had to be running to the back of the train because we know that persons were, they were boarding the Ukrainians at the front. So we said, okay, we have to go to the back. So we're constantly running to the back. As we're running, it's getting darker and darker. And it's getting more full. So the person would tell us, try the next one. And you run to the next one. They're like, no, try the next one. And you run to the next one. Like, try it. And it's getting darker and darker. It's snowing. And there are times running. we went to the wagon, and at, as we reached at the wagon, they just closed Close it on us. Closed the door on us. Go. Try so the we next had to one. just run we on the other side. We kept running and running. Like, nobody knew where anybody was at this point. Everybody just had the, the goal, get on the train. That's it. Just get on the train. Everybody get on the train. So we're running and we're running. And your back is falling off your back. We're, our feet are numb at this point, because we've been out in the cold for so long. Most of us couldn't feel our feet. Some of us, we were burning. Mm -hmm. I almost didn't make it on the train. <laughs> this Jada one. helped me on the train because I had to be carrying my carry-on in my hand. She legit so pulled the, the carry-on. The persons, the persons there, they were fighting us. There were some African guys there trying to push us out of the train. So I'm like, what no. African guys? Yes. yes. It's like everybody for themselves at this point. Yeah. They're pushing so us out of the train and they're shouting and the they're like, stop pushing. I'm like, you're the one that's pushing. So what are you talking about? So anyways, I make my way in the train. And I realized like, that the lady is closing she's the She's closing thing the train on, on me. her. So and she's like, Jada, so I fling my suitcase out and I run back around like I'm coming. And I push the lady out of my way and I pull her off. It was crazy. Can't laugh about it. We can't no. laugh about it. No, but at that time. It wasn't something to laugh about. So I'm like, I'm coming and I pull up her suitcase and I pull her in. I'm like, we made it. Thankfully, at that time, all of us made it on the train. So we started calling like, Calling somebody like, who's in the cart with you? Is this person we're trying to make sure that everybody's on the train. Now. All of us. We were. So that was great. All over the train, but still on the train. So that was good. How are you feeling, guys? How is everybody feeling? You don't know? <laughs> so, Shave, how are you feeling, honey? Guys in the back, how are you feeling? Okay, it's just vibes. The journey was one of uncertainty because a lot of us there didn't speak the language and so if the conductors were speaking to us, we couldn't understand what it was that they were saying. But we did realize, however, that there was a lot of rerouting. So we'd enter one city, stop to pick up passengers, but we couldn't continue because maybe there was an aerial strike there or there were sirens going off to indicate that there could be airstrikes. And at one point, the train was actually stopped by police and they were searching the train. They looked into some Arab men's suitcases, they checked passports. We were actually scared at that point in time because we weren't sure if these were Ukrainian policemen or they were disguised 
Russians. So it was a little, it wasn't a little terrifying. It was terrifying not knowing. There was a lot of uncertainty, but God was with us. I think the most, well, frightening moment for me personally was in the night. I was following a Google Maps, keep it upstairs. Our end goal was Lviv. But two hours out of Kiev, the train stopped dead in the tracks. And then immediately full speed in the other direction. So I was in my head, I was like, oh wow. We are, in, we are in trouble here because obviously something is going on the tracks. And then we spent the entire night rerouting. So the train ride originally was supposed to be 13 hours. It took a whole 24 hours to reach, to reach Lviv. It was night time and we had to travel in full darkness. Um, we couldn't have on our phone lights. All the shutters were closed on the windows. The electricity was turned off in the, the train, so we couldn't charge our phones or any of that. For, for safety reasons, I'm guessing, so you know, the Russians would have a, a lower chance of spotting the train and maybe mistake it for a military train or something. Yeah. The idea was to take all Jamaican students to Lviv, and then in Lviv, you would be organized to move to Poland, and then from Poland, the Jamaican government was organizing transportation and a hotel for you. But you decided to stay on the train. Why? Originally, when we were on the train, they were like, some people were indecisive of, or are they going to stay on the train or leave? And eventually, all of them decided to come off the train at Lviv. But I and my parents, we were like, no. I just knew that the border was like, it was packed. And I knew that if it was packed, there was going to be chaos and there was going to be problems. And we weren't trying to go from one problem to the next. So we were said, OK, we're going to go to Ushgorod instead. Because I, I knew like from hearing people speaking on the train that they were all going to go to Lviv. So I was like, oh, if all of us are going to go to Lviv, then how are we going to be able to all go through the border at the time that we wanted to? So I decided to stay on the train and go to Ushgorod. So that was like a personal decision with uh, your parents? Yes, and with the other two girls, because it was two girls and one boy. The other two girls, all of our, the, our parents decided that this was a better decision for us to make. To, to go to Hungary and stuff? What we did to, to, to support or sending her there was that we went with her because we also wanted to ensure that, you know, what we know of Ukraine and what we read of Ukraine, you know, was either similar or um, should she stay or would we return with her. But when we went, I mean, it was, it was much better than what we read. It, it's amazing. The place is awesome. The welcome we got was excellent, you know, and so it's something that we, we don't have any regrets to date about, even with her experience. How long did you spend in Ukraine? We spent almost a month in Ukraine, in September of 2021. Along the way, for the whole month, it was just a new experience for us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when I left Ukraine, I knew I would go back. Okay. You know, so. You were the one who advocated them to go to Ushgarad, the, as the, the, the town, and then go to Hungary rather than to Poland. Why? When the war started, I went on a lockdown from all the noise that was around, you know, the phone calls and the different things, because I now needed to find out what it was that we were going to do for Rihanna and for those students who I'm familiar with. Um, in terms of going across to the west side, because I was in Ukraine, I also met and made friends. So um, in speaking with them on WhatsApp, I asked, you know, Going across that side, what do you think? But you knew that a lot of Jamaican students were going to Poland instead. Yes, And that we there were, were arrangements aware. made in Poland. We decided for her not to come off because it was not our intention to have her return to Jamaica at that time. We wanted to ensure her father and I that we would know what would come after the war. How will she continue her studies? Her dream was to always study in Europe. You know, so coming back to Jamaica at that time without putting proper things in place would leave us in a position that would not necessarily be in her best interest. I understand the anxiety of many parents who never traveled to Ukraine. So my, my emotions and my response would probably be different than theirs. So who organized the bus from Lviv to the border? 
Uh, the bus was organized by the students. The government was trying unsuccessfully, as well as you, oh, yeah. uh, were trying unsuccessfully to get buses. So we all decided we were going to take the train to go to Poland, straight directly into Poland. Unfortunately, we couldn't get into the train station because the line was already outside. So oh. persons who were there, they saw a lady and asked her if she's going or if she's working. She was in a bus. We told her we were 24, 23. She said her bus couldn't accommodate everyone, but she knew someone else. She called the person, the person agreed. And so we got two buses, uh, paid 1,500 grivnas per person to take us as close to the border as possible because of the traffic. Well, Matthew, uh, he was new there. So he just came there with his tuition for school. But before he could pay for school, the invasion started. So he had cash on him. And the buses were expensive because, you know, as you'd imagine at that time, it was hard to get a bus. So he managed to pay, I think, maybe $800, I think he had to pay. So it's 36,000 grivnas divided by 26. So it's somewhere around 1,300 US dollars. Oh, okay. 1,400 US dollars, somewhere okay, around so that. So it's actually more, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. I wonder if you gave the money back to Matthew. Um, no, we, I, I have not. <laughs> I, have, I, I, I have not as yet. <laughs> to be honest, it didn't cross my mind. No, but the thing is, I thought, I think he was supposed to be reimbursed. Maybe by the government. Yeah. I hope so. Member of government, well, he wouldn't be the gov member of government. He's a member of the opposition, Mark Golding. He contacted me and he was like, I got your contact and I, we want to help. The opposition wants to help the students in Jamaica to, you know, get out and stuff. I contacted him back and I'm like, um, you can indeed help us with um, some finances because the guys in Kharkiv, they need money for the train. He did a direct bank transfer because we use the same bank. And then I got that money and um, that's how we were able to get money from them. Upon getting to Poland, the, uh, we were reimbursed for the buses that Matthew paid for. The hotel was also covered by the government, so we didn't have to pay anything out of pocket for that. And the return flights to Jamaica, they also um, paid for that. Did the Jamaican government reimburse the funds or did you use the funds that Mr. Golding sent you? The government. So what happened to the funds that Mr. The Golding The funds gave? that Mr. Golding sent to us, uh, we used that um, to offset some costs for ourselves. Yeah, so we use that for ourselves. It was divided equally among all the students. So the only member of government that has contacted me is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith. And obviously Miss Silly. Uh, uh, Miss Silly, she's a consulate. For, um, she's located in Germany and she was in Poland when we got there. She made the arrangements. So she was the one home. who organized everything in Poland, as I understand, or as was together with the Polish side? It was together with um, Friends of Jamaica, so that's Olivia and um, Brinsley Ford. When we got to Poland, um, I think the Friends of Jamaica are the ones who did the major legwork. They were working hard while we were walking towards the border, and when we got to the border, they were still there. Um, they spent hours waiting for us. They didn't get frustrated or anything. They just, they were amazing. I'm so happy to Morning. see you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Arena. <laughs> Start with you. <laughs> Olivia, she's one of the um, presenters of the Ostruda Reggae Festival here and was very instrumental in the Jamaican 50th, uh, where they, you twinned with... Yeah, we twinned with Ochi, Ostruda twinned with Ochi. And Ochi. now she's a restauranteur uh, yeah. of Boom Shakalaka. So oh. myself, actor, musician, uh, radio presenter, TV presenter, I came to... Poland about three and a half years ago and uh, just loved Poland. You have connections with Jamaica? Yeah, I have a family in Jamaica, but also from Guyana and uh, really born and raised in, in, in the UK. Jamaican government was uh, telling the story that they've been trying to help with the vacation of the students and the friends of Jamaica are the ones who helped. So you are the friends of Jamaica, who else? <laughs> I think, I think that's the, the title we probably were given. Um, but the, here there is a WhatsApp group called Jamaicans in Poland. I'm Havor and I live in Poland in Mooch. 
Um, I've been here for quite some time now, and I'm actually a part of a lobbying group for the, the diaspora here in Poland. I'm from Portland, Jamaica. Um, well, people know me from all over because I lived also in Montego Bay, in the grill. I'm definitely from, from Yard. Did you take any part helping uh, with the creation of Jamaican students? Yeah, definitely. We have a group um, and I think all of us um, played a part in it. Um, but when, when it happened first, I immediately messaged um, my, my other, the other diaspora members and I said, hey, what can we do? Because we're so near and obviously they don't come to Poland anyways. Um, I messaged, um, I remember Olivia and Brinsley who actually were on that side and we all played our part. So yeah, we were definitely in communication. We had even some help from Costa Rica and the others who wanted to help with medication, so on and so forth. So we did play an active part in it, myself included. Denise Seely, she was waiting in Krakow, organized the hotel. So the Jamaican embassy in Berlin, uh, in care of Denise Seely, took care of everything from that point, took them shopping, got them stuff that they needed. So uh, Denise Seely needs to be mentioned because she was here on the ground with us. Did the Jamaican government contact you to help with evacuation or did you contact them or how did that happen? For many years, Olivia has been the posting for well, running the Polish Facebook for Visit Jamaica for JTB. So she received the phone call from Gregory as it was like, look, there's a situation that's happening here. Can you help? Olivia immediately got on the case. Obviously, being able to speak Polish, it, it helped. And she tracked down so many people with vehicles that either couldn't do it or were at the border. At one point, I remember she said, oh, I've got someone. I think it's going to happen. It's, uh, she was speaking to someone in Ukraine. And we waited and waited and waited. And then suddenly when she did get in contact, the woman said, I'm in a bunker right now. It's absolutely impossible. We can't do anything. You were trying to organize transportation from Ukraine to Poland. Okay. Yeah. yeah, well, I wasn't successful in that either. It was like next to impossible. If no fuel, bunkers, it's just, yeah. Once you got to Ushgarad, there was nobody waiting for you there. there was so what no did you do? One there. Thankfully, my mom has a friend who's from Austria and he had a friend who was living in Ushgarod and that person's grandma hosted us for the night or for the morning because we reached there about like 11 p.m. and we slept and she was so amazing before we went to sleep. She, even though she was speaking Ukrainian, she didn't know one bit of English. You just knew, you knew what she was saying. I mean, apart from the little words we knew in Ukrainian, you know, she was pointing here, pointing there. So we knew what she was saying. She gave us supper to eat and she, she, she actually started crying at one point for us. She was so like, like um, down about the whole situation. She felt so bad for us. Like she was just like, eh. she was just doing that the whole time. And we're just like, it's okay, we'll get out, we'll get out. Then we went to bed, we got up and you know, she, we came in the kitchen and lo and behold, there was a full meal waiting for us. We ate so much. She was, she was very, very hospitable. There is a total of 14 checkpoints at the border of Poland and Ukraine. Seven of them are for railway transport and the other seven are for motor vehicles, with only one having the option to cross the border on foot. It's called Medica Checkpoint. As a result, when the Russian invasion started, all people who had no transport went to Medica to cross. And by the 26th of February, the waiting time there was over 24 hours for them. That's why one more checkpoint called Krakowicz was opened for refugees going on foot with waiting times between 6 to 10 hours. And that's the one Jamaicans decided to try. So everyone in Ukraine is trying to exit, whether it's through Poland or Hungary, but everyone is exiting. There are cars there for miles, for kilometers, and it's just a standstill traffic. Nobody could move. Or bus was bypassing the traffic by driving on the other side of the road, which angered persons reasonably. If you're waiting in line, everybody else should wait in line. Um, persons were angered, and so you had a group of civilians who formed a human barricade stopping any vehicles trying to bypass the traffic and that's what happened. 
So you were trying to squeeze in. Mm -hmm. Why was he trying to do that? He was trying to get us to the board as quickly as possible. So that you don't... So we wouldn't have to walk, we wouldn't have to stay in the traffic. But you still ended up walking. Unfortunately, he couldn't go any further, so we decided as a group that we were either going to go back to Lviv and try to get on the train or we'd have to walk in. Uh, we voted and the majority was to walk. The walk was, on Google Maps, it was 30 kilometers, 30, 33 kilometers. Mm -hmm. It was a hassle to get these buses in the first place. So finally, we got on them and we're like, okay, we're on everything. Things are looking a bit better. It's looking a bit less dim. And then we're going and we're going and we notice that these, some Ukrainian persons are like in the road stopping vehicles, pulling people out of their vehicles. They have buttons. I think somebody said somebody got pepper spray. They had pepper sprays and they just stopped our bus. They came in the road and they're like, stop. They stopped the bus. So the lady's trying to explain to them like, hey, these are foreigners, these are students. We even showed them our passports that we we're Jamaicans, but they didn't really care at all. We were actually feeling a little better because we were on our way out of Ukraine until that happened, until they stopped the vehicle. And then we Set were back. basically panicking and some of us started to cry and then one of the Jamaicans started um, going on live and that's how some of the persons knew that something was happening and they just told us to get out of the car. They were basically trying to open the vehicle as well with us. And he was holding the button in his hand and he was knocking the car. And then we started to panic at that time. And then the, the lady, the driver at that time, she, she really so held him down for us. She was so she brave. She stepped she out of the vehicle. Us. And she basically was holding the button from the man. I'm like, she is so brave. We love you. Do you know what was the reason why the bus got stopped? Did they tell you? No. To be honest, I thought that basically we, it would look like we would be skipping, so probably that's why they're saying that we should do. Um, skip them, I guess. But then they were saying if you're black. But then, then again, I saw in the other vehicle, the black person had to. They come pulled out. the black person they, out of the car. It looked to us. Just, it just if you're looked, black, mm -hmm. you have to walk. Yeah, basically, it looked like discrimination to me. People were in the line two days or a day, and then you know the citizens in that era were patrolling. So to see bus just overtaking <laughs> citizens that were being orderly they got angry, so that was the issue. I don't think it was anything of race or anything, but I think us being disorderly was the issue. Why was your driver trying to skip the line? I mean, it's a business, and I don't think they would wait in a line for two days to transport people. So the agreement was that they will take us as close to the border as possible. They were just basically saying to the driver, why are you skipping the line? There's a line. It was civilian police. So they were manning the line and making sure no one was skipping. And they were saying, hey, if you're going to skip, these, they have to come out and walk. Or you go back to the back and start like everyone else. And then we heard about what was happening. And we said, listen, it's best we just walk. It's best Because if we stayed in that line, who knows when we would have gotten out. Were there only Jamaican students and other foreigners walking? Or were there also Ukrainians? I didn't see any Ukrainians walking, like maybe if they were tired of the traffic, they'd come out of the car and walk maybe 10 meters, 10 meters back. Mm -hmm. But that was it. They weren't walking to the border. They were, what, why do you think this is the case? They have vehicles. Oh, okay. And a lot of them, it's not just adults traveling. It would be, have been the wife and the daughter, oh, or yeah, the, the wife kids, and the kids. The small yeah. kids. And it would have been hard to walk with your two children, backpacks and everything with children. It's extremely hard. Mm -hmm. I do believe I saw um, Ukrainians walking, but not as many as um, foreigners, because a lot of them, they're driving, so they will just sit in their cars and wait. So you had um, miles and miles of cars just parked up, not moving. Once we had gotten past a certain um, point, then there were no more cars. Then we, um, several kilometers, and then that's when we again saw cars. 
they just kept some distance in between, I guess, to facilitate regular traffic because you still had to go through a village area where people live, so you didn't want to have all these cars, you know, um, creating unnecessary traffic and um, inhibiting the movement of people living in that area. How you managed to walk that long distance? Well, how I managed, as soon as we came out the van, <laughs> We, lit, we had to start trekking, we had to start walking. And in, as soon as we came out, there was a food stop. There were some Ukrainians giving food, literally as soon as we came out the vehicle. And that was our, our, our first of many encounters with Ukrainians assisting persons walking with food. It was difficult, I'm not going to lie to you. That walk was difficult. And it would have been longer too, because the original destination was like 60 kilometers. We walked to the closest point. During the walk, my feet started hurting me, so I was actually behind the group for most of the walk. But what helped us was that there were Ukrainians along the way that had food ready for people going. And we got like three hitchhikes. A border guard gave us the first one, second one was a couple, and then the last one was a doctor who actually dropped us at the border. Cut out like the last five kilometers. So yeah, it wasn't that bad, but it still was challenging. I had done like two joggers, and a thermals. So you I was, had thermals? Yes. I, make, I made sure I put it on before I left because I knew that we would be standing at the border for a very long time. The only problem was my shoes. I had my winter shoes. It had lining inside, but the cold penetrated the shoes. So I don't think I processed how cold it really was. It went down to negative 12. How did you manage to walk for so long? I think it was a case where because we weren't doing it alone, it made it somewhat bearable. So different personalities and we already knew each other. So we kept each other going, we kept each other motivated. Uh, I had on a pair of shoes that I had to take off. I didn't throw them away. I had a pair of slippers with me. And so I had to do the walk in those slippers because my feet started to, yeah, they started to swell. But so it I had was to, cold. I had on thick socks. They were very thick. So I actually didn't feel the cold. Maybe my feet were numb, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I didn't feel it. We didn't even have the strength. I don't know how we even found it, but we made it through. Honestly, at one point I kept saying in my head, you have to go home to see your mommy. You have to, have to go home to see your little sister. Like, they need you. You have to make it. We can't feel our feet were still going. At one point I was closing my eyes and walking. Did you have hiking shoes? Um, no. <laughs> no, most of us are wearing our winter boots. <laughs> Some, Some of us were wearing, wearing Crocs. <laughs> Some persons were in Crocs. <laughs> Crocs. Crocs. Then it started to snow out of nowhere heavily. And when I say heavily, it started covering my glasses. You know, just the breath covers your glasses and you can't see anything. And you were carrying bags. And because the snow melts, your hands start to get wet, your feet start to get wet, and when it's wet, it gets blisters, starts to pain. My hands, they were numb. They felt as if I was crippled. My fingers stripped. Up to now, I'm still suffering from stripping because of the cold. And I'm still having pains probably in my lower back and my arms because what I carried for so long. It started snowing so bad. <laughs> up in there. No, go up. Go up. Go up. Up in that truck. Be up here. And here we have it. Tiring. Malcolm. That rough brother. <laughs> Help. 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 The walk was roughly six hours. How did you make it? I mean, how did we make it or how did I make how it? How did you make how it? How did I make it? I think, <laughs> I don't want to say it, but I have to say it. I think it's probably my ancestors' blood. All those, you know, those, the ones that came on the slave ship, the one that survived, those blood, that blood was reignited inside of me. So I had to push. Walking for such a long time in cold weather is very challenging, even if you have proper gear. 
proper shoes, no suitcases, you know, even if you have everything, and that's still challenging. I don't think you had any proper equipment. No, no. We what did were not. you? What shoes you had? Um, I had a, re a regular sneakers, but I, I, God was there with me. My ancestors were there with me. I had to go. You said you lost one of your shoes. Mm -hmm. How did you? <laughs> I I didn't realize I lost my shoe until I was on the train to Lviv. Because I guess the adrenaline and everything, I didn't notice the cut, I didn't notice I lost a shoe until I sat down and I realized, wait, the floor feels different on one shoe. And then <laughs> and I realized I lost a shoe. It was a nice shoe too. It's unfortunate. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not a big deal in this situation. Yeah, it's not. It's not. I mean, I'm, I'm but a, but it is a big deal how you walked thirty kilometers with one shoe. No, okay. Luckily, <laughs> I, I had a change of shoes. So <laughs> you I, had I, your suitcase with you. Yeah, but you know, it wasn't winter shoes, so you know, my feet were cold and wet, and yeah, it wasn't nice. So. What did you do with your suitcase? I managed to bring it along the entire way. So all so. that walk for 30 kilometers, mm -hmm. you were pulling your suitcase? Yes. Ladies, I have a question as a woman. Bathrooms. I think that's a long bathroom. What did you do? I mean, with men? It's all right. Uh. Yeah, With the women, I've ever went not go. We didn't show up to the bathroom. <laughs> no, there were no bathrooms. I wanted to pee so bad, <laughs> and I had to hold it up. When I reached at the border, and finally in that section, they had a bathroom. I had to run. It was legit coming down on me. So at that time, we weren't thinking about going to the bathroom or taking a shower at the border. But walking. When we passed, that's when we started to think about it. I still didn't. I didn't do anything. I so I didn't you said the reason I asked because walking for 30 <laughs> kilometers <laughs> in the day. cold will make you want to go to the toilet. Definitely. So that's like, and for guys, it's not a big deal. No, because they can they just go around. The I mean, some, some, some of the females did their thing. I mean, we had on a lot of clothes, so. At that point, I was not risking it. I just wanted to reach out well, the bathroom. We got to a point, though, where there was a bathroom. There was a bathroom yeah. there around the corner, and there were also porta potties at another section of the road that some people went. So there was a little access. The walk, as I mentioned, was about 30, 33 kilometers. Fortunately, along the way, you had some Ukrainian volunteers who, I'm not sure what you call it, but they got sticks, they made fire, and they made borscht, they made soup and they made tea to kind of keep persons who were walking warm or persons who were stuck in the traffic warm. Did they sell these things? No, it was completely free. Okay. Um, we decided to give a donation, like a kind of pay it forward. So these persons are making the meals from out of their own pockets. We decided to give them the grivness we had so that they could buy more produce to make food for other persons coming up. Mm -hmm. Were they also giving this food to people waiting in traffic? Yes, they were. Oh, so they were like trying to assist them? They were assisting every and anyone. It didn't matter who you were, if you were black, if you were white, if you were walking, if you were in the vehicle. Okay, they were giving so to everyone. just everyone. That's what I'm saying. Granitza. 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 Joel, no, yes, sir. Black people alone oh, have done like this. Look, look, look at that. Like All the folks mo oh, moving. Like you have Makala over there eating black like black headlines. <laughs> Auntie? No, I don't have to be me. I have to wear a pot. I have to wear a pot. I have to wear yeah, they... Silver container, like. Oh, no, I'm not drinks. <laughs> See some drinks over here, so iced tea. Yeah. That's one of the things that you know shocked me, or that I appreciate because where you have bad, you always have good. The Ukrainians along the road. We had volunteers that were there giving out food. They would see us, they would say, come and rest. We have food, food is free, you need to rest. We also got help from a medical aid. 
and that one, you know medical aid, they have priority. And he went, he took the first set and he went back for the other set and he took us there. When we reached the board, I was like, God, this is it. Finally, I'm here. I'm going to cross over easily. Just to see this extremely long line there. And I was like, oh God, this is going to take us another five hours. And it actually took us like eight hours to cross over. The conditions were extremely cold. Like I felt like that was the coldest I've ever been since being in Ukraine. And I guess it's because we're not normally outside at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. So I knew there was a long line of vehicles, but I didn't know there'd be a lot of people on foot as well. It was packed. And there, based on how they split the lines, the first line, there was no fire or anything. So you're just in the dark, in the cold. To get through that first line without any warmth, we, I think it took us maybe four hours, I think. It's, so, it's crazy. It and, cool. and even one of the students, as you heard, she succumbed to hypothermia, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it wasn't easy, trust me. I think even in the Ukrainian line, some people are also suffering from hypothermia as well. Was, it, was there like foreigners separate from Ukrainians? Yeah. Well, no, actually, there was a, there was a separate line over to the left of the border where it was strictly Ukrainians, but in our line, there were also some Ukrainians. Maybe those Ukrainians in that line, women with children and pregnant women? Maybe. Because that, there was a special line for them? Maybe, that's possible. Cause that line was a lot shorter, so it's possible. But for us, there was like a mixed line of like locals and foreigners, a lot of foreigners though. So initially when we got there, there were four lines. The officer that was stationed there, he had everything under control. When it was about like five hours since we have reached, the, that officer ended up changing to another officer. And I mean, that officer seemed inexperienced. So a lot of people now, they weren't orderly. And a bundle happened. People were pushing and trying to get to the other side. Um, the line that I used was that I'm pregnant. So I told them, cause I was getting cold and some of the girls were cold. I was like, I'm pregnant. Can I go over to the other side that they have something warm, the, the fire and hot tea and everything. And he was like, okay. And I said, these two girls also, I had to get some of us, you understand? So, you know, after people saw us going, they started to push and they wanted to come also, so it was a big chaos. There was a bus that took um, citizens from the Ukrainian side to the Polish side or to passport control. But, you know, women with children or pregnant women, they were given priority. So as soon as that line was finished, everybody else was left behind. There was a fire area to warm up, but it was still cold. You had to come out of the line at checkpoint two to just go and warm up yourself. And then it was another issue getting back in the line because the Ukrainians were policing again. So if they see you step out of the line, they don't even look at your face to say, okay, he was in the line. They'll just, when you go back now, they say, no, he, why are you in here? Why are you here? You weren't here before and they tried to get you out of the line and try to make you start back from the back. That happened to us and we had to argue with them to let them know that, no, we're not going at the back. We were in the line and we're going right back where we were. We just went to, to get some heat. And they accepted? Yes, they ended up accepting, accepting it. Were they just policing the foreigners or also Ukrainians? Because I everybody, know Ukraine they were policing everybody. So it wasn't just the so foreigners? So it wasn't just foreigners. Okay. But right. the issue was that most foreigners don't speak the language well in order to communicate and explain that they were in the line before. So because of that, they didn't really listen to us and they just forced a lot of foreigners to start back over. The only people who were allowed to evacuate from Ukraine, among Ukrainians, were only women and children. And children. Uh, men were not allowed. No. And that's the thing. And how do you prioritize women with children where pretty much everyone is a woman with a child? Yes. Do, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And this that actually helped us because afterwards, you know, we started to tell them that we were pregnant too. We were like, listen, we're carrying and we've been standing here for some time and that's when they sent us across. 
<laughs> so we actually used that as a privilege because I couldn't feel my feet. Remember, I had on slippers. And right. then it was snowing, it was raining, so there was a lot of puddles where we were standing. Water was cold, and I didn't realize that I was in a puddle. So one of the girls, she became very upset with what was happening, and he, she told the guys, listen, these girls are pregnant, and he let us across. Who was the girl? Chelsea. I saw people going to just warm up and then come back. So I asked, can we, can we go? He said, no. Some other um, citizens, they're, they're not Ukrainians, but I think they're from like Tur 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 Turkmenistan. Oh, Turkmenistan, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and he also asked and he was told no. So some pretty Ukrainian girls came and they asked him and he said yes. So I was angry now, so I was like, why is it, I was speaking Russian now, I was like, why is it that you can't allow me to go? You know, I'm human too, is it the, because of the color of my skin? And I showed him. So at that point now, he was like, okay, girls, come back. He called them back and then the crowd was like, no, 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 let them go, it's fine. I'm like, no, I'm cold also, all of us were cold. So if we're gonna let some, some of them through, you have to let me through because I'm not used to, she's Ukrainian. She's used to the cold, I'm not, we're not, you know, at least pardon us. So I was very angry at that point. So what happened in the end? Did he let you through? No, he didn't. Did he get the girls out? No, no, no he so called the, them back. The cookie called them back? Yes, he did. I was like, yes, let them come back. It, it's, that's just the situation. I if see, I can't I see. get warm, you can't get yeah, warm. Yeah, yeah, I see. That, that was the first checkpoint. But when we went to the second checkpoint, um, you know, you had, Ukrainians that were being their own police and you know if you leave the line because that was the area where they had the fire and the, the tea and like soup so if you leave the line to go and get warmed up and you come back to your space they will tell you no you should not come in or they will act like they didn't see you you were never in the line and they did that to me at one point and I was like no because I've been standing here for like seven hours I'm not gonna go back to the back of the line I mean the fires are here for us to warm up you understand? Like, I understand that everybody want to go, but be, be partial. You know, I was getting angry. She was holding on to my suitcase and like she want to drag me out. And I was like, if you touch me, you're not going to like it. Please let go of my suitcase. And then the other people, were, they were like, OK, let her stay, let her stay. So I was there. I was there. I was like defending the Jamaicans because some of them, they were scared. They didn't want to like speak up. The well, other couldn't one speak up. up. They couldn't speak up because they didn't understand Russian or Ukrainian. How could they speak up also? You know, this is the one of the, yeah. All right. Were there other people doing the same thing, like Ukrainians also trying to push in or Ukrainians were not allowed to join the queue yes, yes, where they would leave? Yes, yes. So it was the same for it everyone? It was the same. I mean, like, I think everyone was just for their, themselves at that point. So th they weren't looking at the human side of it. You know, under such circumstances, they weren't. So anyone was a victim to that. We took a taxi to Chop, the, the railway station, and we took the train from Chop, and we crossed the border of Hungary into Zahoni, which is in Through Hungary. With the train? Yes, with the train. It was like 20 minutes. Yes. And you were able to get It was very the... easy going, getting a ticket was very easy. Them checking the passport, even if you didn't have your Pozvitka, they checked the legitimacy of your passport and they allowed you to leave. Like, they were very, very nice. So that there. was just so easy? Very easy. I just can't believe very easy. this. I, because it wasn't a lot of people there, so they weren't pressured, they weren't pressured. I mean, the soldiers were there, you know, because it's, it's a point of leaving yeah. the Ukrainian um, country, but. So basically what happened was we just got a train. Mm -hmm. Did you have to fight nope. to get your place no in the fighting. train? No, it was simple. Just went on the train and sat down and just took us right over to Hungary. I can't believe that. <laughs> it was very easy. I can't believe I thank God every day for it being so easy. <laughs> oh my God. And people had to go through hell to get through that yes, border in Poland. walking for kilometers and ends. Yes, yeah. and you didn't walk anything? No. But did the train stop and the soldiers came in to stamp your passport? Or what yeah, happened? they just stamped it. And they were, like, they were actually like making jokes with us. Like they took up my passport and they're like, oh, Jamaica, you saying bold. Uh, so it was like very funny. They were very accommodating, you know. Oh, those were Hungarian? Yes, Hungarian, Hungarian policemen. Police. Yeah. What about the Ukrainian ones? When, when leaving CHOP, did the Ukrainian ones came to stamp your passport too? 
When I got the ticket and I joined the line, I got the stamp when they checked my Pozvitka and I just joined the line and when the train came, we just all boarded the train. I wish, you know, people knew about that uh, at start and they would have sent people to Ujgara. They, but you see, you had connections in Ujgara through your mum. Right, right. So that was one that of was the... The thing. They should have gone to Hungary. But who knew? No one you knew. You know, and also Hungary doesn't have, you know, Hungary is more close to Russia. Yes, And um, that's probably one of yeah. the reasons why Ukrainians didn't want to go there, because mm -hmm. Hungary has, maybe that's the reason, I don't know. But Ukrainians all went to Poland they, because they had connections there, but they didn't have. And I mean, the culture is very more, they, it's more similar to Ukraine than Hungary, so they would choose Yes, you know, yes, Poland. Poland is closer yeah. to Ukraine than yeah. Hungary, yeah. definitely. Wow, this is... This is gonna spoil my whole narrative. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm gonna. <laughs> responded to mounting accounts of Africans being mistreated as they try to flee Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It seems that there's a hierarchy of Ukrainians first, Indians second, Africans last. And these border guards are letting Ukrainian yeah. citizens pass, but they are stopping the Indians. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. They are even taking the Africans and Nigerians also, but not Indian students. Did you personally experience any discrimination or racism or anything like this before the war? Before the war, I experienced racism first year. There was a situation where I wanted to change money. I don't know what happened, but this the Ukrainian man, he told me to leave. And he did it so rudely. He was like, get out of my, my store. And, I was like, I'm trying to change money. Why are you telling me to leave? So I feel maybe he had a bad experience with a black person in the store before, and then he felt like all of us are like this, and he just discriminated against us. So I never went back in his store since that happened. So that was the first time I experienced racism over there. And then there is racism there, but it's not, necessarily like very obvious it's more like what can what's the term to use to describe it it's like in small it's in nuances like simple little things the way how when sometimes when they see you they they just put their face a certain way and walk so things like those but that's expected you're a black person in an all-white country i don't even know really how to explain it is it different from the kind of racism that you that hear about in America? In America, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's not How? that hard. It's not that 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 obvious or out there. Because as I said, they'll be racist to you, but like in small ways. Not necessarily they'll call police on you or because I've never been stopped by a police since I've been over there. So That's I don't experience any form of police brutality like what I see going on in America. But being a black person in Ukraine, you certainly stand out. Yeah. Simply because there are no black Ukrainians. Well, That's there true. are, but just very, very, very few. Very, very few. few. Mm -hmm. So have you personally experienced any racism or I something? I did. Okay, um, in what way? My friend and I, Tashiva and I, were entering a store in the mall. Okay. And two men were leaving while we were entering and they started to make monkey noises while they were approaching us. All right, uh -huh. But that's, apart from that, I mean, you get stares from persons, but we didn't when, find when it. Was that? When, when was yes. that? Not okay. immediately before the war, maybe a year before when we just mm -hmm. arrived in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But I cannot say that we've experienced it actively throughout our mm -hmm. stay. I'm not sure. Not me. Right. Personally, the, the looks, the stares, the stares, it, it threw me off when I just came. Like sometimes, and because I, do, I didn't understand, I still don't understand the language 100%, but 
seeing people stare at you and then they would turn and they would say some and they would do it so in your face and say and they would look at you. I've even, even had a situation where a lady took her phone and turned her phone and took a picture of us on the metro and then she hold on her phone and send the picture and we look at her like, Miss, we saw everything, you know, what's going on? <laughs> but they don't care. So the stairs were really throwing me off in the beginning. But then I realized that it wasn't really a race issue. It was just, I'm just different. They stare at Ukrainians a lot as well. Like they do it to each other. Who look different. Look different, yes. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever experienced any racism in Ukraine, like before the war? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say racism. I would say it's because I'm different in terms of I don't speak Ukrainian, that people would probably um, realize that, oh, this person doesn't speak Ukrainian or they, or they don't speak Russian. But I don't think it's in the sense of discriminating against the person or, you know, treating the person differently in a negative way because of their skin color or something. So definitely no. I think the Ukrainians, they definitely like, like to see people from Africa or the Caribbean because even on the train, people will be like, giving you a thumbs up, you know. There were some people encouraging you and they know you were a student there. So, yeah, I, I didn't really experience racism there, no. I think, like, there was a point where we were going on the train and I was going to sit somewhere and this guy held on to me, basically telling me that I shouldn't sit. Then he allowed a white person to sit. And then I just stood there. So then, when the person got up, I sat there at the same space and he was in the same area. So as soon as I sat there, he just moved off to another part of the train. So I'm like, okay. Is and it then, Metro? Yeah. So in total, I've been in Ukraine for five and a half years. Um, the interactions with the people has not been bad. Um, a lot of people speak about racism, but I can't really speak to that. There was one instance where in a supermarket, some guys were cashing out bananas and they were like, hey, do you want a banana? But separate to that, I haven't really experienced anything. Um, yeah, I haven't experienced anything separate to that. The people tend to mind their own business. So for example, you're on the street, something is happening with you, they'll just walk by. That's what I generally observed in Ukraine. You have some people who are the opposite, where they're much kind of more open to certain things. I guess these are the people who are more traveled and more um, you know, exposed to different cultures. I have not seen in my six years being in Ukraine, not just at the border, I have not seen any discrimination or racism in Ukraine for my six years. What did you think when you hear about it? You heard about it, right? I heard about it, of course. Um, with social media, everybody hears everything. I thought it was a case of misunderstanding. So from what I understand is that the person's board in the train in Kharkiv it was the first half of the train was for persons who had tickets. The second half was for anybody else. Uh, it's not an orderly system, so it's not like there is a line and it's the first person that gets to go in. It's everyone, it's just gathered and you're forcing your way into the train. That's it. I don't believe that the soldiers were taking persons off based on their skin color, no. I find it hard to believe. We're going to ask the people who actually used the train to see what their experience at the straight t train station was. But what about the border? So one of the Jamaican girls, as you would have heard, was sick. Uh, within the area that we were, there are no bathrooms. She wanted to use a bathroom, so we had to go out of the barricade uh, a few minutes, maybe two or three minutes, behind where the soldiers were. When we took her to the bathroom and we're coming back, one of the security guards thought that we were trying to swindle or we passed the crowd to get inside. So they let through Tariq, the girl, and the other girl. But because I was behind, they thought I was trying to swindle my way through. So the security pushed me. And after we explained that, no, we're already inside, um, another security guard came and he vouched for us saying, yeah, four persons came out and these are the four persons coming back in. That was it. I would say racism and racists rather are everywhere. So of when course. I heard that, I personally thought might be the case, you know, because it's just that Ukrainians don't have that many black people in general to practice racism. Do you see what I mean? So I was like, well, maybe that was the time, you know, to when practice. it could pop up, right? I didn't experience it. 
I asked a few Jamaicans as well, and they also agreed they didn't experience any form of racism. We lost, discrimination. We lost them, yeah. Have you personally experienced any discrimination like during the actual evacuation because you're black? No. I no, I wouldn't say I have because I'm black, no. What kind of discrimination did you <laughs> No, have? I I mean, I understand that in any event, a country is going to put their own national first, you know, their own people first. So, you know, Ukrainians had it a bit easier to go to passport control than every other nationality. And I do understand that, but any aggression that I, fa I faced, it, it was general. I don't think it was because of my color. Mm -hmm. I think it was because people were under stress or, you know, just the entire environment. Hearing it now, like, and seeing it in the media, um, I've told people a lot of times that me, personally, I haven't experienced it. I cannot speak on those that say that they have. Lucky enough, I haven't. So that is my point of view from the whole experience. What was your experience? What do you think? To make it what? on the train? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do just you think there was like discrimination? Not because someone had tickets, someone not had tickets. But you cannot get on the train because you're black. Honestly, from, there was no order. So it wasn't like, oh... I did hear that some people had to get off the train after, but I didn't... Oh. They did say that some they made some people get off the train. But do you know the reason? I for wasn't. No, no, we don't we were, know. No, we just heard about it. But from what we were experiencing, it was just chaos, really, to get on the train. So it's just like, if I get there, I get there, and I might push someone out of the way to get there. That's what. Yeah, just we just wanted to get, to get into on the train. train. As you know, in the news, there were quite a lot of points made that there was racism and discrimination on the train station. Like, black people were pulled off the train so that white people get in. Basically, that's what they were saying. Did you see any of this? Um, okay, kind of. Okay, when I was waiting on the train, there was an, a separate train that came, but it was going, I believe, directly into Poland. At least that's what I heard from the other people and they're only allowing women and children on that train. But then in one of the carts, when I was waiting and looking, they, they, I saw some black people come out. Uh, some people were saying, why is it that the buses are filled with uh, Ukrainians only and not, foreigners no, are not allowed because, on this bus? Okay, so some buses were private, some were arranged. As foreigners, I mean, yes, we're in the country, but we are, to some extent responsible for ourselves. So whether the way in which we exit the country is up to us. So no buses were particularly provided for us. We had to maybe charter our own bus as we did or get a taxi or something. So we, were, um, we wouldn't have been allowed on those buses because they're, they're not our buses. Yeah, I wonder what would have happened if somebody tried to get on your chartered bus. We wouldn't allow that, <laughs> I mean, because we don't know them. They could be anybody. On the way to Poland, I guess the only discrimination would be a soldier started flickering lights at me. I went to him. Um, he was like, let me see your phone. Um, are you taking videos? I'm like, no, I'm not videoing. I showed him a translation. I'm saying this is what I'm trying to get sorted out. He's like, oh, Jamaicans. I don't know anything about any Jamaicans. Later on, I realized that he was a said shift supervisor who they had made contact with and he refused to let us go. Yeah, he was like, oh, everybody is sick, you need to wait. Ukrainians are oftentimes they don't take the time to figure out what you're trying to explain to them. And even in my case where I did show them that, hey, um, my people are at the border and um, they are trying to get us to come across because we have someone who is sick, because even um, when we took the sick person to the front were like okay could you allow her, this person to go ahead of us uh, because she's very ill and then they will pick her up at the border and then we will wait so like no you will stay that would be my only view of the discrimination right there have you personally experienced any discrimination or racism in ukraine before the war before the war no i've never experienced racism at no in no form whatsoever and all my experiences have been just and fair and okay 
Yeah. What about during the evacuation? Was there anything that you would consider that way? During the evacuation, I would not say I've experienced racism. And the only severe act that I experienced would be the hindering of students entering the train. And I don't, and, I, and initially they allowed, they allowed us to enter, but probably with force or with a little fighting and with a little shoving. So I wouldn't say I've experienced racism initially, no. Was someone trying to take you off the train? They were trying to prevent, the train conductors were trying to prevent some of us from entering the train. The Nigerians, they were bombarding them, you know, he was trying to pull them back. The Nigerians, they started to flood in and he's holding people, he's holding and the guys, they push him out the way and he's still trying to hold, still trying to hold, but they went in. I followed suit, they were pushing behind you, they were pulling you down and it was just a fight to get in, but I got in. So, so why yeah. do you think they were preventing you from entering? Well, was it because... I don't know, to be honest with you, because even when we formed a line, one of the conductors at the other door, he wasn't even letting anyone in and they were in an orderly fashion. The next one, I think they, the, the people in the line just got fed up and just pushed him out the way. So I think, they were, he, I think initially they wanted to give Ukrainians preference. But there were not a lot of Ukrainians there. There were just a few, a handful. I'm sure most of you experience boarding an airplane. As you know, you don't just walk onto an airplane because there's a narrow path between the seats. You get stuck in a line waiting for your turn until it clears. With Ukrainian trains, the situation is similar. In terms of, there's also a narrow path which gets blocked easily, just like on a plane. During the evacuation, people were flooding in and the narrow path in each wagon was filled in no time, but people kept pushing. The conductors were trying to handle the crowd and do their best to make sure people don't squash and kill each other. And that is why they were preventing people from boarding until the path was clear, and only then allow more passengers to enter. Your first three incident from my perspective was interesting because I was the last one off the platform or the other group. So what happened is that we got on the platform and the crowd was huge as expected. The train was longer, way longer than it should be. But most people were funneling towards the um, the first half of the train because they could see the corridor, the arm, um, the lady pointing towards the back due to the language barrier. They didn't understand, so they kept trying to force their way onto the train. And then the first air track happened, boom, and we're like, we have to get onto the train. And what I saw was <sighs> racism is like a sensitive topic around the world. And people like to think that it's always though like white people or the fair skinned people at fault. But what I saw, uh, well, what happened, like all the conductors, they're all ladies. So when the one that came, the, the missile that came close hit the train station, everybody fed. A group of Nigerians actually brought a battle against the train. Now to that lady and forced her all the way back and then they created a uh, chill and put all of the people on first so all the Nigerians went on first and I don't know it was heartbreaking to see that people of my color would do something like that because I knew that this would never get reported in the mass media you were like you never see it from the black side in the mass media and that also have implications because the next train now we were entering, you could see the terror in the old lady's eyes because of course we were spread. They were really terrified of us and black people because they couldn't distinguish um, difference between Nigerians and Jamaicans. So they really just let us be on the train without any problems. Although that being said, I was pulled off the platform by a Nigerian <laughs> to get on the train. So that happened. The situation was dire. I will, I will give them that, but then again, it hurt me the most because as soon as we reached the border, there was reporters calling us, asking about what um, if we had any racist experience. There was videos going out about black people suffering. And I was like, to myself, this is not half the story. And I, don't, I didn't want this war to become 
about racism because Putin is trying to make it about some Nazis. He does. I didn't want the intention. Well, I didn't want the inter international community to like make it. Oh, ra Ukrainians are racist. Look at how they treat black people. Let's not support them. Let's not um, give them our more on financial support. So that was really heartbreaking for me. And I understand that all black people are good or bad, but things happen, I guess, is more. I personally, I didn't experience any racism or prejudice while trying to get on the train. But I had a friend from Nigeria who evacuated like a day or two days after me. He told me that while he got, he got on the train, and there was some conflict situation and a Ukrainian held a gun to his head and tell him to get off the train. And I don't know personally what happened, what situation took place between both of them, but he had to get off the train and board another and waited on another train. And sadly, all his friends were on the same train he was on, and they were trying to find out what was happening as well, but... But wait, if all of his friends were black friends too, yes. but they were not forced off the train? No, they were not forced so off the train. So do you think train. it was the case of racism, or do you think it was the case of some personal conflict? I am not sure. I really That's... do not know. That's a question I, you would have to ask him if I get contact with him, that and then you'll perfect. speak with him. Any of these messages about discrimination and so on influenced your opinion about whether to evacuate or not? Uh, no. Not in your case? No. Well, you've been in Ukraine for six years. So I've you been know in Ukraine for in. six years. But you said the Ukrainians are unfriendly. They are unfriendly, but being unfriendly does not equate to being racist. Do you think some people who don't have experience with Ukrainian culture might think that way, though? It might be construed that way, but once you get to know Ukrainians, it's the furthest thing from your mind. It seemed that the, the world had got this, this uh, situation that the racism was happening in Poland. Obviously, I have to speak for my side of it. And this is a question that because this came up and we were hearing this news in England, I've asked other Jamaicans that are in Poland. To date, we've not had anything like that. And uh, I just think it was just uh, at times when the situation is, is happening and it's in the news, you have people coming up with all different uh different sides of the story, you know what I mean? Generally, and on the accounts that I've known, and I've been in Poland for about three, nearly three and a half years, um, basically there wouldn't be a boom shakalaka if that was what we found. So no, I haven't found that. And if I can speak, because this really concerned us, right? When, uh, and I was so deeply disappointed, but therefore I don't trust media, right, this much. There are people, at each and every border because they heard this news. So this is like a humanitarian and non-profit organizations who decided to monitor if that's actually the case. So every single day they report to us so that nothing like this happens. So, and when it comes to racism, yes, there is racism in Poland. I'm not gonna say no, because that would be a pure lie. And I think there's racism in each and every country unfortunately. Are you a couple? Yeah. Right. Do you ever get uh, any looks or any like racism towards you in Poland? Never. Uh, never, happened. Never. never happened. I give the benefit of the doubt before I judge anyone. So I made some calls because I near food. I saw the Nigerians being treated a certain way in a video or two or three. And I made um, my investigation. I did some investigation. And it, I got nothing. I got nothing back. I was, it was like inconclusive in a sense. So I could not say that it was true based on my experience here in Poland. I can firmly say I've never experienced racism at all. I would say they embrace you. What people don't understand is that, all right, so let's say black people don't understand is that in Europe, they, we never had um, slavery, right? So people, we, we were oppressed in the West because of slavery, so on and so forth. These people in Poland, they've actually never seen black people, some of them in the villages, they see them on the TV or they have pictures of us looking like a, 
a charcoal guy with a big red lips. And when people see you, they're like, a, I'm like Jay-Z, right? Just uh, not that, you know, not <laughs> that famous, but I'm like Jay-Z here in Poland, in my opinion. It's kind of cool. But a lot of things that Ukrainians do can be perceived as racism, like they would stare at people, oh, but that's because oh, they've never yeah. seen black people. So. Yeah, all of the Polish, they stare, like, stare me down. But, you know, I'm thinking that they must have seen me or think I'm some kind of um, someone popular just because I'm black. It happens a lot as well. Or you look like someone they've seen on TV or you look like the, the only black person they know. So <laughs> it happens. But what actually happened at the border, Olivia spoke with one of the guards and he agreed. He said, look, take my picture. He put a light on his uniform. The image of this officer was sent to Tarek. Um, and so watch out for him. And he said, listen, I'll be walking as close as possible towards Ukrainian border. So what he did was amazing. and. All of a sudden, all the customs officers, both men and women, were running around looking for Jamaicans. So once at the Ukrainian border, looking right over into Poland, I saw, uh, I think, a police or a soldier. He came over and he was saying, is there any Jamaicans here? So I felt special. I was like, Looking at everybody else, I was like, I'm Jamaican, I'm Jamaican. <laughs> and eventually I got to cross over and he showed me that there was a bus right there waiting on Jamaicans. And it was like, there's food here, water here. If you want anything, just take it up and go in the bus. It was very hospitable. I must say the whole situation felt so different from being over the Ukrainian side. The soldiers were more aggressive and hostile, but on the Polish side, they were so welcoming and smiley. And it just felt like you just stepped out of... The war. Yeah, exactly. It felt like you just stepped out of the war from a era of confusion to a era of tranquility. Well, actually, that's the reason why Polish guys were calm Calmer. and welcoming. Yeah. And the Ukrainian guys whose families are at home somewhere in other bomb shelters had to be at work and letting people pass through. I didn't, didn't think, think about, about that. I was thinking about my safety and me getting over. I, was, I didn't have several persons. I didn't have much people in mind more than just trying to secure my safety. And I think that was everybody's thought process. You're just worrying about what's going on with yourself inside because you're going through a whole process as well. And in your head, you're confused, you're scared. So you don't get to look at other people and say, OK, they're scared as well and they have families in the country and they're not around them. So I guess things like those we don't think on. And I guess it's after getting out and actually reflecting, you realize that they were scared as well. Inside. Hi. Welcome to Poland. Hi. Welcome to Poland. Hi. Hi. Say welcome to Poland. It's when they were coming across the border, I saw everyone was like screw face. But by the time they get into the bus and then the patties come out, I see smiles started to come. They were tired, but yeah. it was nice to see them feel relieved to, after that whole experience. How long did you spend at the border in total waiting for them? All night. We were there all, all night. night till all night. The they didn't come in. Yeah. Around 7 a.m. They, they didn't come morning. until the next, mo next morning. Yeah. The fact that they stick together that they um, really massive respect towards Tariq and Owen, absolute leaders. I know that they were presented with a lot of Jamaican food. Were you the people who cooked that food or you have some chefs who cook it? No, no, we, we actually cooked it. It was boom shakalaka. We were, as you know, up all, all 
well, nearly a 24-hour stint. But yes, we, we cooked all the food. When I got to Poland, the atmosphere changed. I can understand that the Ukrainians are under pressure and as I told you, the, the voice or the language is aggressive in nature. The Polish people, they were very welcoming, they were calm. It, it was just a change of atmosphere. I felt relieved and happy over there, but I don't know, I was just happy. You were happy you made it? Yes. Of course, well, you should be. I don't even know if I showered first or I slept first, but I know that I was happy to see bed because I haven't slept for like five days. So, you know, I was very happy that I was there. Once you got on that bus, that nicely, nice bus, the blue. <laughs> it was a nice bus, I have to admit. There's a lot of food on that bus too. This part was a lot of candy, a lot of sugar, and I slept, to be honest. The entire bus ride, I slept. Was there ever a moment when you thought, when you were scared, and you thought that you wouldn't make it while you were in Ukraine? No, to be honest, I'm a very nonchalant person. My main concern was like, I need to get a million females out of this country, especially my group, which was, I was close with Jada, Shane, Alia. That was mainly my concern. That's why I used most of my tuition fee as well. That was the main goal behind it. I was so tired. I, I, I was obviously relief. That's the biggest feeling I felt. And I knew that I was in now um, Poland. I was just like, okay, this is NATO territory. We're cool. I slept a lot. And I, f I, felt, I felt just relief at that point. Uh, when I got to Poland, um, there was a sigh of relief, but then there was still um, some feeling of sadness because Whenever you leave people that you have a connection with, you always become sad. And then um, leaving them under the circumstances that um, we did, it was quite sad. Especially um, our friends who um, helped us to get to Lviv. Um, we, well, they left their um, grandfather. He decided he's not going to leave. So that created another, you know, sad moment. But it was with great relief when um, we got to Poland. When I reached the Poland, the first thing that I did when I pulled up my laptop was trying to find schools. <laughs> that was the first. And I didn't even You're try to. Serious. I didn't even try to look and say, what is happening in I just type in cheap medical schools in Europe, trying to find something else to move on to because I knew I knew what I was coming back to. I knew that you probably would not take us. I knew that there wasn't going to be any other option in Jamaica, so I needed to find something else try and find it as quickly as possible. I couldn't sleep. Oh, okay. I don't think she could sleep either, because <laughs> we were in the hotel. I couldn't, I couldn't sleep at all. I'm like, okay, I'm not sleeping. But like a friend from the diaspora in Poland that was like, hey, you can't sleep. Let's, let's, you want to go and see Poland a bit? And she was sleeping, because she's my roommate all the time. You know, she's in love with me. She can't get enough of me. So. <laughs> we're always together. Always together. So. I thought she was sleeping, so I was writing her a note to say, hey, this is where I'm going, this is where I'm with, blah, blah, blah. And I hear her talking. So I'm thinking she's up and on her phone under the sheet. She's talking in her sleep. And she's saying in her sleep, sleep, I'm scared. I'm like, Shanae? Shanae? I'm realizing, like, she's asleep, but she's in her sleep. I thought she was on her phone. I'm scared, I'm scared. So I'm wake her up, I'm like, are you okay? So it's a very traumatizing situation. Like, up to this day, we suffer from PTSD. Because honestly, on the walk before, I was trying to be optimistic. But at one point, I was in my mind, I was just like, yeah, I'm going, just making my peace with God. I, re I made peace with God. Like, God, if this is it, like, I just started talking to God. So when we finally crossed the border, I'm like, OK, it's, it's not my time yet. We made it. At a point, I thought that I wouldn't make it because I'm just in this situation that I never expected to happen. And at that moment, I just texted my mother and my other family members, and I'm like, I love you. And I broke down. I definitely broke down. Like, up to now, I don't want to cry, no. <laughs> don't cry. I'm not no. crying. <laughs> but I definitely.
don't even think I realize that it's over. I don't, I don't think I've processed really what I've went through, even to this day. Because when I was on the bus, I was just thinking, what is next? I, I wasn't thinking about what I went through. I was thinking about what is next, what is going to happen to me. My school, that would keep me occupied, but the minute I'm not doing anything, it brings me back to being in Ukraine, being at the train station, hearing the bomb drop right behind the train, thinking that, oh my God, that, that bomb could have dropped right here. <laughs> it was so close, you know? Are we going to be well received in Jamaica? Like, that was my main thing, thinking. Because what was happening here, like, we, I personally thought that Jamaicans, they didn't really care because they were saying, who sent us there? We sent ourselves there, so we should deal with it ourselves. That was, the, that was how I felt, personally. That's how I felt. I think it's also the culture of Jamaica, how Jamaicans are as a people, very black and white. Okay, yes, you went through a war, but time to move on. What is next? Move on. You, did the, you went there, so you need to figure out what is next. That is basically how it, how it felt. And sometimes I still feel like that, but I know that there are people in my corner helping us as Jamaicans to try and get our lives back on track. It's a lot to take in. We're still trying to figure things out. We're thinking about um, going to other schools. We're also thinking about working. It's just a lot to take in all at once. And to know that we just started in December. We barely even started. We didn't even cover anything. It's a lot to take in, honestly. Like mentally? Mentally. <laughs> it's, it's a strain mentally. I, like, I don't feel like I'm in a position to function like right now. I'm so sorry that it had to happen like this in Ukraine and it had to happen at all. And the fact that you turned out to be there in the first place, like it was like, why didn't you go there for September? You know, like this coming September, is that what something you've been thinking about? That's... My mother said that we should go. You should... We had a lot of setbacks and obstacles getting a lot to Ukraine. Of setbacks to head to Ukraine. We missed our flight the first time. Not the flight, the tickets. Yeah, the tickets. Because for some reason, because like I said, we do everything together. So we booked the tickets together as a group, but my e-ticket wasn't coming up for some reason. You could see my name on the system, but the ticket number on the e was not coming up. So that's how we ended up missing that flight. And at that point, after everything that else we had gone through to this point, it was, there was a lot of obstacles. Our parents were like, September. And we were like, we were like, we we're already pushing. invested so much money. We've already, already done this, might as well. But look at that. We went and... <laughs> you, you believe in God, right? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. He was definitely... Definitely was saying, we've missed all the signs. What about your education? What are you planning to do? Because you had only a few months left. A few months, ah, yes. So they are trying to continue with online education, but then you still have disruptions. But they try to get through as much of the material as possible and all of that. And there is a time difference where Jamaica is eight hours behind Ukraine. So if I have a class starting at 8.30 a.m. in Ukraine, then I have to be up for class at 12.30 a.m. in Jamaica. So. I'm on the night shift. Currently, I'm in third year, which is halfway through the program. At this moment, I'm trying to see if I can get into UE Medical School here or try to apply to different European countries. You can call me naive or stupid, but I do hope that I'll be able to return and complete my degree there than to be a transfer student. But if that is not the case, I do hope to transfer to other countries in Europe. No, I, 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 don't, I cannot afford Jamaica. That was the reason why I left in the first place. How many months you had left? Two months. Medical degree? Yes. After six years of studying, what are you going to do now? I am unsure uh, what the next step is. Um, the government has been in dialogue with UA, which has not been fruitful thus far. Universities in Poland, Hungary, Lithuania, surrounding Ukraine, they are cognizant of what's happening in Ukraine and are willing to take students in. The problem is that they are prioritizing Ukrainians first, which is understandable because they're most affected by what's happening. 
and secondly, foreigners who were in Ukraine displaced who are currently within the different countries. We are now in Jamaica, so we are at the bottom of the list. If you were to continue your degree in Jamaica or anywhere in the world, actually, you, you still need to get the documents from Kharkiv. Uh, the universities that are surrounding Ukraine, they are understanding of the situation in that they are aware that we can't get our transcripts. They are aware that we can't get even our documents that we use to apply for the universities. So they will accept us on that basis. And uh, when things are a bit calmer, then they will try to get the transcripts. Uh, Jamaica is the opposite. They are not willing to take us without a transcript, which is impossible to get at the moment. Okay. Well, maybe this video will make them change their mind. I, don't know. Well, I really don't want to leave Ukraine. I really don't want to leave my education, like take it from there and go to some other place because Ukraine became my home. It became my second home from Jamaica and it was just becoming such an amazing experience. So that being disrupted was, ah, it was different, very emotional. Yeah. Okay, would you want to come back to Ukraine now? Yes. Definitely, like if everything just stops, everything just is back to normal, I would definitely go back to Ukraine. To the parents um, whose students studied, um, your daughters, your sons studied in Ukraine, all this caught us unexpectedly, some will say. Some would say we knew what was coming. However, do not give up. Do your research. Your daughters and your sons can still study in Europe if it's your desire. They will still meet their goal as doctors. Do your research, see where they can go. Some might want to go back to Ukraine like my daughter. When we sent them to Ukraine, we sent them with the goal of becoming doctors and this should still be their desire. Students, do not give up. You will be doctors. Might not have been when you plan, but your goal will still be achieved. So just hold on. Keep the faith and you will become doctors in a few years to come. And you will have a lot of stories to tell your families in the future. I'm actively involved in academia as I, I have a language school here in Poland and I cooperate with private schools, universities, law firms. People who were left kind of in the middle of their education, can they apply and study in Poland or maybe in some other European countries? What are their chances? Now that they have the opportunity to get their transcript, definitely they can come back to the Republic of Poland. We, we actually advise um, them to do so as it is cheaper and easier on their pockets as well. And we they have the help here in Europe that can assist them in that regard. Like, should they contact you? Should they contact some ministers? What is their now to-do list? For education, it's definitely me. They contact me via my email or WhatsApp. Um, and I will then tell them what's needed, what's necessary, um, and what universities are open, what the offers are, what the costs are, and where the, um, how you know we can help with financial funding. What about students who are not Jamaicans, like Nigerian students? Can they come and study in Poland? Absolutely. Um, I think most of uh, Nigerians are a big part of um, the European community, and I've seen a few. I know a few. All the people. All people about well, all students who have been affected in the um, Ukraine can come on to the Republic once they've, you know, come on illegally or they've, you know, taken a certain route to get here, then definitely they can resume their studies here in the Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, do you also help them if they decide to go and study in Hungary, for instance, or in some other country, or is it only for Poland? You know, um, the door is not closed. I mean, if I can find a link. I know people in, like, for example, Germany, we have connections there as well. We have our embassy there. Um, the Netherlands, um, Amsterdam, Europe is a whole country on its own. It's not, we have no borders. So why should we limit the opportunity? I don't see why not. Thank you so much. This is perfect. I wanted people to have this kind of, you know, what next so that they can continue um, with their future, you know, because they got stuck. And thank you so much. Anytime. To the Ukrainian people, the world is with you. We empathize and we sympathize with you. Um, we are constantly praying for you. It is quite unfortunate and it's um, heartbreaking to watch the news, but people are in support of you. We wish that or we hope that this um, barbaric action um, will come to an end soon. So, we're praying for you. Slava Ukraina. Oh, 
what would I like to say to Ukrainians? I would like to say that I admire your patriotism very well, so much. Like, I've never seen a set of people so brave. And I just wish them that, you know, everything... I just wish them success. I just want everything to be fine. Ukraine is my third home. <laughs> Second to US. Ukraine is my third home. And as much as how, you know, sometimes I have bad experiences there, I have bad experiences everywhere. I would like to go back to Ukraine. So, you know, just guys keep on fighting, be safe. I know that I'm praying for you guys and I wish to see my friends, my teachers, everyone soon. Ah, Slava Ukraini. That's all I can say. Glory to Ukraine and continue to be strong. Continue to support your country. Never give up, don't accept defeat. And I pray that God will keep you guys safe and this ends soon and the world can come together and rebuild your country. What would you like to say to Ukrainian people? Wow. Thank you, really. It helped me and my colleagues a lot to uh, stay there and my heart goes out to you. It really does. I watch the news, I see what's happening. It's, it's really devastating. Mar Mariupol is gone, basically. So my heart reaches to you. No, this is not the end of your country. And you're in my prayers. First of all, I would have to say thank you. Thank you for being so brave. Thank you for being so courageous. Because to be in that situation and experience it firsthand, and to know that there's still citizens there fighting for their homeland, it, it lets your heart pain because it's something that should have never happened in the first place. So thank you for being so strong. And Ukrainians are literally the strongest set of people in the world because you're the leader of President Volodymyr Zelensky is, 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 is a great leader. And the Ukrainian people are behind him. And it's a very orthodox country in, in terms of Christianity and God will, will punish the wrongdoers. And all I can say is to just keep strong and continue to be brave, continue to fight. And whenever it's time to rebuild, if I can come to help to rebuild, I will because it's also my home away from home. I've spent almost literally two years there and that is home for me. So I hope that I can be able to come home when it's time as well. I would like to tell the Ukrainian people, you guys are strong people, fierce people. Keep defending your country at all costs. I want to tell them that my heart goes out to them. It can't be easy. Oh God, that's an understatement. I, 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 can't even, I can't even know what they're going through. But my heart goes out to Ukraine people. Keep strong, keep fighting, keep praying. And I pray that you guys will beat Russia. Send them packing and you guys can now rebuild um, your country. Thank you. Thank you Slava so Ukraini. <laughs> to Ukrainian people, I would say in everything, in everything that happens in our lives, it happens for us to be stronger, for us to realize where we are and where we stand as a people. And in all the madness, there is good. And I know that Ukrainians, you Ukrainians are patriotic you are loving you are caring people and you will you will be victorious i believe that when this all ends ukraine will be stronger ukraine will be bigger it will be ukraine will become a force to be reckoned with so just keep the faith and slava ukraini hello i am slava i would say to ukrainians stay strong I mean, it's very cliche to say that, but the Ukrainians really have this drive and motivation to stick together and stay strong and not even be an army in the military sense, but be an army with their emotions and the struggles they've been through. So definitely stay strong, keep fighting, keep being passionate for your country, keep being patriotic, and soon it will, it will be over. Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava. I know this isn't the end, 
and I'm waiting to see Ukraine, the country I fell in love with again. Thank you so much for watching.